Hello, everyone, and welcome to Smashbox TV's podcast 179. I'm your host, Terry Miller, the Disc Golf Guy, along with Johnny V. Hi, Terry. Yo. I'm doing my best to cover up as much of your face as possible. <laughs> yeah, thank you. If you could just get a bigger microphone screen I, here so I, I can't be seen on camera and I can't see anything going on on my computer. Uh, if the, you could just put a hood over my face, we'd be doing about the same. We attract a whole different crowd <laughs> when you start wearing hoods. Um, so I didn't, when I ordered the windscreen, it didn't exactly have like, hey, this is what it looks like against a quarter. Um, I didn't expect it to be that big, but uh, because they didn't have any more of this style left. I don't want to make my face any bigger, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to do quite the opposite, in fact, well, of making my face bigger. It's not too bad on screen as we see, so we'll be. I think we'll. I think we'll make it through the night. Yeah, I guess we will. Well, again, welcome everyone. We've got a great show. I'm I'm jacked up. Uh, we've got some amazing guests. We're going to be opening the show in just a few minutes, and having Dave Felberg, who's going to give us some details about the next gen tour. And if you don't care about the details, he's still giving away a ton of prize stuff. That is which true. Which is awesome. I think he's got a $100 gift card, uh, a massive Latitude umbrella, and a pair of socks. So we're going to be giving that away, uh, which is going to be awesome. Later, we're going to be talking about the Marksman League from Dynamic Disc. We're going to have a giveaway regarding that. And then, of course, for our Patreon-only supporters, we'll also have a giveaway that comes two or four or six hours later whenever our after show takes place. So... Some solid giveaways tonight. Uh, after Dave Felberg, we're going to catch up with Jennifer Allen along with Steve Dodge. And this is almost a, more of a roundtable discussion type night where uh, Jennifer Allen was talking about the some of the shortened tees that she saw this weekend as we were out in Arizona. And then, of course, we've got a, I don't want to call it a counterpoint, but we've got the other side in Steve Dodge, who's... Uh, of course, organizing the Disc Golf Pro Tour, working with people like Keith Murray over at Spinners on the Green. So there'll, there'll be some more conversation regarding uh, just the, the concept of these shortened tees that were kind of talked about and introduced last year. And then, spoiler alert, if you're waiting on my video for another day or so, uh, close your ears because the winner of this weekend's Shelly Sharp Memorial presented by Spinners on the Green was in fact... Paul Ulibarri, and Paul's going to then be joining us later on tonight as well. And Paul's a regular on the show anyway, so it works out perfectly. He's, uh, he's, a, he's a normal contributor, and he's a winner. So uh, either way, it's good to have him. Everyone so, who's a contributor is a winner, Terry. That's true. So before I go any further, before the show can even really get started, in my opinion, there's a couple of thank yous that I want to personally uh, dish out here quickly because this last weekend was awesome and there were some things that happened and went down and without these people, it wouldn't have went the way it did. Uh, so first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Boyd Brown over at First Light. Boyd and Dan, incredibly gracious. Boyd was a host. He was a chauffeur. He, he, he was so amazing. He put me up at his house this weekend and uh, we had some great conversations. Boyd, it, it's, it's so good to meet someone couple years older than me, but he's only gotten into disc golf seriously in the last four or five years. And so comparing perspectives uh, on some of our 20 and 30 minute car rides was great. So Boyd, thank you so much. I, I, this weekend was uh, so much smoother all because of you. So Boyd, thank you. Uh, Keith Murray, of course, who I just mentioned over at Spinners on the Green, along with Ashley and everyone else over at Spinners. Chris Cobb, a regular smashy out there on uh, on the bag this weekend. I had seven straight pars on Saturday, my second round, seven straight pars, some of which are pretty good, some of which yeah. aren't so good. Yeah. Chris shows up for hole eight, double bogey. <laughs> <laughs> hole nine, I throw it in a tree and it sticks. I think uh, another double bogey. Bogey, bogey, bogey. I'm not going to say you were there for all of the bogeys, but you were there for all of the bogeys. On Saturday, but he picked up the bag, uh, came you, out and caddied for me who on do you blame Sunday. On for Friday I'm just and... saying, I was playing great golf. Nope. And you're not Chris, used to, was it? No, no, no. But yeah, you're right. It wasn't great golf. I was playing much better golf on Saturday <laughs> than I opened on Friday. Uh, we'll get into all that later. That's not even I, I was going to say, did it have something to do, and we've talked about this, where Ricky doesn't have a caddy usually. You're not usually one to have a caddy. Granted, you're not usually one to play. True. But 
do you think it threw you off at all or was it just no, you no. hit i didn't i didn't oh think. no it had nothing to do with the caddy it was great no. he was uh or not even so much the caddy or a caddy no or, or it, it didn't like caddy. mess with my flow or anything like that i just i couldn't catch a break and i wasn't throwing really well just the, chris showed up in time yeah for those. those two at that course usually don't well together if you're not catching breaks and you're not throwing well you that's a well, adds up to a lot of OB strokes. There's this thing called scoring, which is going to be talked about with Jen mm. and, and uh, mm. with Steve Dodge in terms of scoring and how scoring can be done. And uh, I, I fit into some of those categories. And then last but not least, uh, Pat Perman, uh, a.k.a. Yuli's mom, uh, the Yuli brothers. Uh, she was also out with us on Saturday night. It was so good. Uh, as we realized, we've known each other for so many years and always uh, interact and, and and always encouraging and, and helping out one another, but we've never really had the conversation as in-depth as we did on Saturday night, and it was it was one of the highlights of my weekend to be able to talk with her as two of her sons are obviously competing and at a high level, and uh, it, it was just awesome getting some of her stories and perspectives, uh, which is just something we've never really had a chance to do. So uh, those are all the things that have to be uh, thrown out there again. Uh, thank you so much, Boyd. Though he was he was a lifesaver this weekend and and was so gracious in so many ways. So I appreciate that. We must be really doing well this year. And I want to thank going along with things. I want to thank everyone who this week has become a Patreon supporter. We had I am not even joking a flood of them at the beginning of the year. There, I think we picked up twelve or thirteen new Patreon supporters. So I want to go out there and say thank you to everybody who's joined. I updated our, our little list and. There's the Patreon, obviously, if you're interested, patreon.com slash smashbox TV, or we fix the super chat as well. We yes, that that's all good week. to go. So we're good to go now. I think <laughs> we're, uh, we're we're all set. I've got time and date stamps for uh, this time, but let's uh, we'll, we'll put those in the show a little later so we can okay. get right to Dave. I think we can dial them up. Or maybe how about you start dialing up Dave Well, I go ahead. I've got a couple of the date stamps. First of all, Melody Bailey's birthday. Happy birthday to you, Melody. She's uh, We're going to hopefully see her more on tour this year. That's one date stamp. New drone was released by DG, DJI today, the uh, Mavic Air. That will be relevant more later. You'll see that. And it's the first day after our government shutdown has ended. Which was a very, very short government shutdown. And I have a rant for that later. Those All those <laughs> people on both sides of the aisle, you are failing us as humans by not getting your jobs done. We are not seeing you yet, Dave. Go ahead and show us your video. All right. And that's as political as I'm going to get on it. Yeah. Both sides can take a jump in a lake because that's how I feel about that. Uh, you are failing us. All right. We're going to see if we can get Dave Felberg here on the show in just a moment. We've got him on the line. He's just having a problem. Oh, there. Here it comes. Click on a little button. There you go. go, Turn your camera maybe a little bit. Perfect. And with that, I think we've got our 2008 world champion and uh, the... One of the head guys over at that Next Gen Tour for the third year. Let's bring him in. Dave Felberg. How you guys doing tonight? Good. Welcome back to the show, Dave. How you doing, buddy? Great. Just getting ready for the uh, season. Yeah, you are. It feels like it was just like two months ago we were wrapping things up and giving away a car in Arizona. Yeah, that's how it works. You know, it's a pretty much a year-round tour. So <laughs> It is uh, pretty incredible. I saw Chris Kesselhoff playing again in Arizona this weekend. He, f- he fared pretty well at, by the end of the weekend uh, as he's Top now moved three, into right. the professional ranks. Top three in his first eight tier. That's pretty solid. Not too bad. Have you had any conversations, any follow-up with him after after uh, his his car win? Yeah, we're working with him to try to get something going. We think it'd be he'd be a good representative since he was the champion of the tour. Okay. Well, uh, he I, if, as far as I know, he was there all three days on time. So that was uh, – sounds like he's moved into his pro <laughs> career. Uh, it's a good start. In a solid start. So, uh, Dave, we're looking at now the third year of the Next Gen Tour – Let's let's hammer on some highlights. What do we got? Well, you know, the first thing we want to talk about is what you do is you go back to the drawing board and you see what people complained about and said we could work on. So the first thing we wanted to do is uh, add more divisions. So what we're going to do this year and keep our gender non-biased uh, ways is we're just going to offer three levels of rating, which is 935 and higher, which we'll call the Gladiator, and 900 to 935, which we'll call the Knight. And then 800 to 899, which we'll call the Saint. And basically, you you know, there's no gender bias. You just play in the divisions and you go to the regionals. 
And then the best part of it is we'll have regional champions in each of the divisions at the regionals. And instead of it just being the top division that gets a chance to win the car, the top 10 overall scores in that regional championship, depending on division, will advance to Arizona. Wow. Hmm. And now, did you just let out another secret? You said advanced to Arizona. Is that is that where we're going to see a, a finale again? You know, I don't see any reason to fix what's not broken. Okay. So uh, Fountain Hills, of course, was our host last year. Uh, an amazing place for golf. Uh, just a beautiful backdrop and setting. Uh, not on the in the Western time zone. All right, that's my last Chris time zone joke. Um, but perfect place to have the finale, especially come November. Uh, so it's awesome that we're going to be back there again. And they've got great signal for live. They do. All right, all right. Um, so you're going to expand. You have these three divisions. Something else I think I caught wind of is last year you guys kind of had the official amateur status with the PDGA, and people that have accepted cash at any point were ineligible. Is that the same this year? Oh, uh, the difference is this year we're just going to follow PDJ rules, and I'm glad you brought up the PDJ because the other thing we wanted to talk about was PDJ uh, strategic partnership that we developed this year. Um, you are correct that uh, PDJ allows people who have won cash as long as they follow the guidelines to maintaining uh, an amateur membership, they can be reclassified if they have not won cash within a year in the ratings under 970. So now we've opened it up. Hey, if you're 968 and you have won cash in a few years, Call the PDGA, they'll reclassify you instantly, and you can be eligible to play. It doesn't hurt you in any way. And next time you win pro cash again, you can go pro again. You know, so it doesn't really hurt you, and it expands it. And then, you know, the strategic partnership is that this year, all C tiers for the qualifiers, all B tiers for the regional championships, and the final will be an A tier. Oh, and so okay. we worked. We, yeah, so we worked with the PDGA in that way, and the uh, virtual challenge actual virtual challenge instead of being confusing will all be hosted by the PDGA. Okay. And the, uh, I think the other key factor is that Cynthia and I worked really hard with the PDGA. And if you know, last year the, we attracted about 800 non PDGA or non renewed members. And so we don't want to turn those people away. So we've worked with the PDGA to waive the $10 fee for first uh, NG events for non PDGA members. Mm. Wow. So it'll be the first time. PDJ does something like this in an effort to try to increase their membership and outreach to these people who are obviously playing tournaments but not PDJ members. Wow, so it's it's certainly making things in so many ways far more inclusive. Uh, you're expanding and having a little bit more in terms of the divisional breaks. You're allowing some of the people that maybe have cashed a year or two ago uh, but have been in a dry spell that are under 970, they're going to be eligible to reclassify as amateur, and then also allowing people that have uh, that aren't current PDGA members to kind of get a, a one-time pass as uh, they can compete and come and play as well without paying that additional fee. Uh, one of the big conversation pieces from last year was, and I don't know if it was just feedback or if it maybe was uh, added a little bit of criticism or not, was that you guys weren't PDGA sanctioned events. There was a lot of these events going on, more than 100 uh, were initially scheduled. And so wh what did that mean for you guys to team up with the PDGA and uh, have a much closer relationship this year? Well, it, you know, they, they're the organization that runs the sport, you know, and being able to partner with them obviously is going to be positive for our tour, but we think that we bring something to the table by attracting these players and trying to grow the sport and, you know, taking our tour to the next level and associating with the PDGA. So we think it's a great partnership, and what they're going to be doing for us is helping us just get out, out there more to their PDGA members and, and try to offer this experience to their PDGA membership this year. And, and you know, you can get, earn points for AM Worlds now, and all those things go hand in hand. You get your rating, and you're still qualified for NG, and all these things go hand in hand that people were concerned about. And so the, it's a double, very double good for the PDGA because now they have events that, you know, everybody wants to play in that also work in their system. They're able to collect their fees and and promote the sport like they're supposed to from the grassroots level. Well, and I think what's great about that is, like you said, not only can they earn the points, but they can also then know that they're going to be subject to all standard PDGA rules. There's going to be PDGA enforcement, PDGA ratings, and all of those things that are tied into uh, being at one of the events. I, I think there's another additional change uh, for this year in that you guys are now allowing tournaments that are maybe already established 
to then also double up and be qualifiers? Is that the plan? So it doesn't have to be no, a standalone not, event or no? They're going to have to be standalone this year. We're not going to do the double up. We okay. thought about that, but the dilution factor is no good. So what we've decided is we're going to add payouts and trophies to the qualifiers since they're sanctioned events. And now they can feel like a regular event. So you'll get your PDJ points, you'll get your PDJ rating. We'll have a payout script. We'll have trophies. And then you'll still get all your qualifications for NG regionals and the winner goes to regionals and all the you know top 25% move on and all that stuff. So we basically just earned and we made combined what you would say a, a PDJ event with an NG, but we did it on standalone event. Okay. Okay, so that was a clarification that uh, we had talked about a while ago. So I was a little uh, behind the scene or behind the times there. Um, what are you guys looking at in terms of the numbers of events this year? Is, is there a goal? Is there a limit? What What are you guys looking at for the qualifying events and then regionals and so on and so forth? How kind of break down those numbers? We're looking at, you know, more than 150 qualifiers. I mean, we're expanding all the way, I believe, to Hawaii this year. You know, we had a last last year. We'll keep them. And, you know, we're just going to keep growing. And we're, But we reduced it down to eight regionals because we thought that some of the areas should be with other areas. So it was eight regional championships and still the national championship. So, you know, it could be up with near 200 qualifiers. You know, there's lots of people interested. And now it's kind of open. We're taking applications at our website, you know, and you can – fill it out and if it's going to be added to our schedule we'll look it over and see if you fulfill our criteria and maybe we can get you added you know so our goal is to get every area in the u.s there's so many areas people don't think of in clubs that are clustered in little small towns that have 100 players that would love to have their club do a qualifier and so you know that's what we're trying to do is is make sure we cover everybody and give everybody a fair shot at it and get everybody involved and for some of those that might be wondering what what are you guys looking for in a qualifying event, uh, you know, from the TD, from the club or organization, what are some of the things that you're going to be looking at when those applications come in? You know, just the fact that they, you know, people are going to be interested, they have enough participation in their club, that they have the club support, you know, that's not just somebody out there on their own trying to be renegade and they the club's against it and they're just, you know, filling out the application. We want to see club support. We want to, you know, see some experience in running tournaments and you know you could be a new timer as long as you're enthusiastic but we'd like to you know make sure you have all the clearance and you check with your state coordinator and all that stuff instead of just you know getting added to the schedule and that'll be determined by our regional coordinators and directors which this year we've expanded our team greatly to a lot of people out there in the nation who'll be helping run the tour and uh i hope that uh-oh you're good you're good dave Okay, and so I uh, sorry about that. Sure. So I hope that you know it'll be a lot more organized this year. Last year we had some disarray here and there. We can't deny that we were you know first time going national, and so hopefully this year you know we have a lot more organizational processes in place and more help. And so I think that you know you know it'll be a lot more organized and, and brought to you in a, in a better fashion this year. Well, I think there's a lot of people who are listening or will will come to this uh, after the fact and want to know. How do you see uh, the event, the registration and or uh, prize packages, things like that? How do you kind of seeing that unfold? I know last year you had a, uh, an idea, and I don't need to know every single detail of every single event, what they can expect. But what, what's kind of the general premise for how you expect people, uh, it, their experience to go when they sign up for a, a regional? Well, we're going to uh, or for a qualifier. Or just yeah, a for, a, for a qualifier. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, um, what we're thinking is that we'll open registration sometime in, you know, mid, late February and, you know, maybe March. We're working on, on that, you know, trying to decide the right timing of it. And then once we have the registration out there, people can expect we have a new uh, players package. All I can tell you now is that the two discs in the players package this year is going to be a first run Ballista Pro Burst X. So it's a, a new disc that nobody's seen, and it's going to be a far fly and overstable you know, distance disc, you know, not too overstable, but more overstable than the usual ballista. It's going to be burst and gold line, and the only place you'll get them is NG. And then we're going to try to attempt, uh, last year's going to attempt to make their first 2K glow disc, which their 2K line is their overmold, and so they're going to make their first glow Seric for us, and that's going to be a limited edition run only for us. Wow. So I can tell you those are the two, you know, this. and you can, like I said, there's going to be other things in the player's package, plus there's going to be the payout today of trophies all the stuff at regionals we're going to do a 
uh, a kind of a layered uh, payout where we're going to pay all three divisions the same, maybe the top 12 in each division, and just do a solid payout all the way through with, you know, $1,000 packages minimum at the top for each of the divisions and all the way down. So we'll make sure that they get paid out pretty well. We're, uh, you know, finalizing all the sponsors for this year and making sure everything's in place before we announce that. What would you say is the number one thing that you learned? What was the number one takeaway? Uh, and it could be good or bad, but what was the number one takeaway that you guys are, are taking from last year and you're making sure to e either further or address or fix or enhance? What would be the number one thing that you're taking away from last year to improve upon for this year? Wow, the number one thing I would say is uh, the – Man, that's a tough question. The number one thing, Terry, I, I'm going to go with uh, whether we're going to be more organized in the delivery of things and have the information out clearer and that, you know, that people didn't quite understand everything last year. They didn't understand the virtual challenge. They didn't understand how the tour worked. And so I think it's going to be a lot more clear this year. And I think that the other uh, major process that what people were confused about last year was, you know, they didn't know why to play. And so this year we gave them a reason to play, you know, if they're not planning on being a national champion. Okay. I think that was one of the things that I took away is we got to find ways to keep people happy on the day of. It's not just about progressing them to the next level, which is important, but the day of event itself has to be fun, enjoyable. There has to be some additional things going on there so that people, even if they're not going to qualify, can still enjoy themselves and not just get a package on like a league day. Okay. So I think that's our big takeaways is that we want to provide a better experience everybody now uh one of the questions i think i may have even asked a, you and i got a little confused yesterday even asking about this uh but one of the most popular questions has to be right now last year you gave away a car chris drove off ultimately in that this year there's there's chatter on the board right now someone suggested it may have come from this basement but someone suggested <laughs> a helicopter what what are you guys giving away next this year all i can tell you is it will be a bigger grand prize than last year and a bigger grand prize than anybody else has announced ever. Mm. Wow. That's so like a dump truck. <laughs> bigger. <laughs> it's a bigger. semi. It's one bigger. of, the, it's one of those new bigger. Tesla semis. A new Tesla semi. There you go. Those I like are, that. Those are big. But we'll be coming on to announce that in the you know later on in the season. But there's one thing I wanted to say and address ahead of time so we don't see the chatter about it, Terry, is you know we, you know, we haven't added a women's division yet. That's what people are saying. Sure. And but what we did is we're trying to be non-gender bi, and so we have added the lower divisions. There's lots of women who will fall in that category, eight to eight ninety-nine, and we feel that that we've given them a chance to compete, and we will still have that virtual challenge where there's a women's division, and the winner of the women, like Lauren Butler, mm -hmm. will still get a tour card with a disc golf pro tour. So I mean, this year we're, you know, we're trying to get ahead of that game, but we just want to make sure that we're not a gender biased tour. We want to, you know, maybe, maybe we'll eventually accommodate even lower players but we don't know but right now this year where well, this is our test and see how that goes and you know we'll see how and i, and I think that's a, more players in the future i think that's a great uh, way to go about it as you guys are continuing to grow and ease into finding out exactly where the sweet spots are uh, that this year you could really say you're more of a, a ratings base than ever because like you just said there's plenty of people men and women mm -hmm. that may fall into that 800 to 899 category and it doesn't matter and an 878 rated woman is just as good as an 878 rated man they are they are in every uh since they are completely equal when it comes to their skill levels uh, and how their performance has been on the course. So there's no reason for men and women to not compete um, within their uh, their ratings based criteria, which is one thing that's great about ratings and one thing that's great about being partnered with the PDGA and having that relationship this year that's even tighter so that you guys have those ratings to always reference and to look at. Yeah, we're just trying to give everybody the, the same opportunity. And I think like you said, we're just trying to, you know, rating based event and give, you know, try to put people where they belong, a bit competitive wise, so they're competitive. And I like that, you know, the one that's important to me is that 900 to 935 one. You know, that's a really competitive division. It's people trying to make that step to advance. And, and look at, like I said, the regional. It doesn't matter what division you're in, the top 10 scores move on. An 850 player can very easily have a 950 day mm -hmm. and qualify for the national championship. 
Well, uh, Phoenix Ruger Redberg out in Arizona says an 878 lady is probably uh, playing in the FPO division. That's fine if if she is. She, she's still edu- eligible to compete in the in uh, this event. And if she wants to move on, or if uh, depending on where she plays, if she hasn't cashed, uh, she may be eligible to have an amateur status, or maybe she does have an amateur status and is still playing in the FPO division. And maybe hasn't cashed yet, so it just this provides a lot of opportunity and a lot of flexibility, which is one thing that I really like. Right, you know, we try get count day for all everybody. I believe we're trying, and you know, it, I do say that a lot of those lower divisions, not just women, but uh, grandmasters, let's say, or senior grandmasters who have that rating in that lower category, are sometimes forced to move up to pro at a lower rating because their area demands it. You know, but. That's why it goes down to 800. I'm, I'm sure there's lots of other people who aren't in that category, and we'll find a way to get more people in in the future. We'll try. Well, and it, it, again, this furthers my point in that you could be rated 952 playing ad, advanced senior grandmasters, but you're absolutely eligible to come compete at this event, and your 952 is just as good as the next guy's 952, or or the next person's 952. It doesn't matter. So having these, you know, and you've gone with names, uh, you know, the gladiator and the knight and so on and so forth, it it me- makes no difference what division you're currently playing in. Uh, if, if your rating fits into that category and you meet the criteria, then you absolutely should be competing in those divisions. And, I, I again, I love that flexibility. Right. I think, like you said, I don't want to keep going on. But I know you have a busy show tonight, but I'll just say that, isn't that the idea of the rating system? Isn't that what the PDJ was trying to create? And I exactly. think that, you know, everything's always ahead of itself. You look 10 years back, Chuck, and people were trying to run events that way. But the data wasn't set enough to do it. But now he has so much data, millions and millions of rounds, that, you know, you can't really argue that the data is that far off. There is, there's loopholes. I know, you know, I've said it myself. But <laughs> overall, the data is pretty solid. And, you know, this way you, you can start using the system the way it's meant to be used. All right. Well, it uh, uh, Chuck Kennedy, I think, is out on the board, and when he's not, you just utter his name three <laughs> times, and he shows up. But uh, I think you're exactly right on his his rating him uh, along with Roger. The ratings uh, have done so much, and they've allowed so many uh, additional forms of competition and r- divisional breakdowns uh, where we can maybe sometimes ignore the traditional divisional names and move into something that's just based on your rating and. I think that's great. Uh, is there anything else uh, that any other major news or announcements or things that uh, we're missing out on? As I'm, well, I mean, there, is. There, there is, but I can't really say much. You know, we're trying to uh, you know build it properly, and but we do have some prizes to give away tonight. I don't have any of Synergy's artwork like I usually we usually have to give away. Like, but you know, like I said, it's going to be on the player package disc. So wait like, till you see her drawings this year; they're amazing. But. Um, what we do have to give away, as I, you know, maybe told you before the show, is I have an umbrella, brand new in the box. Yep. Okay. Then I got a brand new pair of water socks, waterproof. Deck Shell, one of our sponsors. Okay. And then I also have a hundred dollar gift card from Infinite Dis, and so I was hoping you would help us give it away right now on the show and make it kind of a ritual, so we can, you know, give people to chime in and and uh, be more interactive in the show. Absolutely. And, and Dave, uh, before we do this, the other one note I wanted to make is uh, I think Dave and I are going to talk a lot more frequently, uh, whether it's on Smashbox or Dave and I kind of have a, an ongoing uh, weekly, uh, we'll say like sub podcast of sorts uh, that will be just specific to next gen. You're going to see more uh, more of the news, more of the media, more of that stuff pushed out throughout the year. And uh, I'm going to have Dave on like seven days a week so that he has to give away <laughs> stuff seven days a now. Uh, but so just so everyone knows, uh, it may not be a Tuesday night thing. Dave and I may go into, you know, an every, every third Thursday kind of thing or whatever it might be. You're going to see more next gen updates coming throughout the year. I'll be happy to help facilitate those. And to make my, my plug, I am uh, helping out and I'm glad to be part of the team uh, in terms of this region. And if there's people in Minnesota, Illinois, and Wisconsin, certainly send me a message. I've already reached out to a number of TDs. I'm glad to do my part to help out. And Dave, Dave went ahead and scheduled the regional championships in Crown Point, Indiana on my birthday weekend. So well, I get to run a tournament on my birthday this year. So thanks, Dave. That's so sweet of you. Yeah, I figured you'd have- 
you would enjoy being there at the your resort for your uh, <laughs> for your birthday there. You know all that you know fun stuff to do in Crown Point. All right, so I've got a giveaway. Dave doesn't even know how I'm doing it. Johnny doesn't know how I'm doing it exactly. Uh, but to recap, Dave uh, is going to be giving away as one package. This is going to go to our winner. I'll give you a moment. Log into YouTube. That's where we're going to ch watch the chat. And uh, the first correct answer that I see will be the person that is deemed the winner. So it's on the YouTube chat live. Um, he's going to give away the package that in uh, includes the socks the umbrella, and a $100 gift card to Infinite Dis. Uh, so InfiniteDis.com, go check them out. They're a great supporter of, of a lot of things for us in disc golf. Uh, so that's uh, the prize package that's giving away to one single winner tonight. And here is the question as we'll uh, answer this and then sign Dave off and, and then uh, get on to Jennifer and Steve Dodge. So here's the, here's the question. Last year at the finale... Chris Kesselhoff, your eventual champion, showed up three holes late. We all know that he took that 12-stroke uh, set of penalties, 12 penalty strokes, to start off the next-gen championships. The question is, what was his deficit to the leader after round number one? What was his deficit to the leader after round number one Keeping in mind, he in fact took a 12 stroke, uh, 12 strokes of penalties to open up the tournament. Hmm. And I see a couple answers coming in of negative 12, negative 17, negative 12. Lots of holy cow, they're coming in faster than normal. I see 12. I lots. have the answer. There it is. I just saw it. Ah. Uh, what? what, what? Uh, sorry. The the answer is 13. 1347 for Mr. Silas Schultz. Um, is that David Garb with 13 right there um, I'm seeing? If that is the first 13 that you see. That is the first 13 that I see is David Garb. The deficit Garb. was 13 strokes to the leader. Everybody's guessing 12 was uh, quite a popular. Too easy if it would have been 12. Is that what you see there, Johnny? I see David Garb with 13. As the first one. Okay. David Garb per Johnny V's official set of eyeballs yep is your winner so Terry you go ahead and collect their information and send it to us and we'll put it right in the mail David uh, please uh, reach out to us smashbox.tv slash winners yep. winner winners or winners winner. I think it's winners yeah winner or winners uh, there's a little form on there please go ahead and fill that out and uh, we'll pass that on to Dave and the ne the nice folks over at the next gen tour and a uh, pretty sizable uh, giveaway here tonight Spoiler alert, the rest of the giveaways aren't that big tonight. <laughs> They're good. They're not that good. So, All right, Dave, we appreciate the updates. Again, things will be more frequent uh, with yourself and me, and we'll be able to keep people up to date. Uh, thank you for all the info. Looking forward to another great year, our third season here with the Next Gen Tour. And uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Yep, we just want to say thanks to all the sponsors that help us, and uh, I can't wait to come on and tell you guys the grand prize. All right. He's teasing us. He is. Kick him off, Johnny. All right, fine. Bye, All Dave. Right, bye, Dave. <laughs> All right, again, David Felberg, your 2008 world champion, uh, who's been quite busy, of course, working on this. I, I know uh, I've seen some of the behind-the-scenes emails. I've not fully caught up on them all. Uh, but uh, I know they're working really hard over there and uh, looking forward to another great season in 2018. Again, third year. A lot of people are saying, Oh yeah, last year you know they gave away the car. It was it's this big first opening year? No, nope. they uh, they were it, they got it going in 2016. Uh, 2017 was uh, bigger, the, and the 2018 yeah. was even bigger. Yeah, no, I even made that mistake one time when we were talking that last year was their first year, but knowing full well that they had a 2016 season, 2017 was just like their big coming out party with the giant with the car and all the events. Don't say giant car. It was just, <laughs> it, well, I mean, giant prize, the giant prize, and a nice little package, a nice little car. All right, uh, there's some chatter on the board, Johnny, as to if uh, Nat Long was ahead. And, again, our, our disclaimer is always that it's the first one that shows up on our screen. And uh, if Johnny has, in fact, uh, deemed it as such. I went through and I saw Garb. He was the first one I saw. And we, we've always said, I know, because there's, there's, uh, how things show up on your screen versus even Johnny's versus mine, they can show up a little differently because of the live chat on YouTube. Uh, 
Uh, so our default answer is always uh, whoever we see first on our screen. Yep. Johnny V's calling it. So if you don't like that answer, I am. I'm I'm scrolling uh, through I just one more address. time. <laughs> I'll post your address. I'm scrolling through one more time to verify, but and it's funny because I don't even see that. Uh, yep, David Garb. Right, I see it right after Sarah Holcomb posted five. It goes David Garb at thirteen. The next correct thirteen for me was. That's it's a ways away yet. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking. I so. I see Tylen Strom as the next thirteen. So that's why we always Jonathan say, Hernandez was would be the next thirteen. But that that's the official one. So we're going official, Mister Garb. Thank you. All right, guys, we appreciate it. <laughs> Somebody said what? I don't. Doesn't matter. All right, we appreciate it. Let's uh, jump over. We've got Steve Dodge, I believe, uh, hopefully hanging out there. I think we're gonna have Jennifer Allen. We've done testing uh, with Jennifer, and uh, hopefully everything. Looks and sounds good for both of them to join us tonight. We're going to be talking a little bit about Disc Golf Pro Tour. A uh, hot topic just in that uh, last year, Sarah Holcomb was one of the people that really championed for this idea, uh, along with working with UDisc, along with working with Steve Dodge, to find out how we can make the women's division a little bit more uh, competitive, but also a little bit more f- uh, viewer friendly and exciting, I think is probably the best way to word that. Uh, and uh, some stats and some other details are what led us to where we're at. So we're going to see if we can get them on in just a moment. We got Steve on. We're just uh, we're dialing up Jen right now. So hopefully we get we can see her in here any second now. I think uh, also it sounds like, yes, yeah, Sarah Holcomb's out on the board. Glad Sarah can join us. Oh, and we got Jen as well. We're going we're gonna to bring this in. Well, I might make it look a little nicer in a couple seconds. But for now, let's go to... Gosh, how fancy. Look at this. Steve Dodge, Jen Allen, welcome to the show, guys. How are we doing? Can't see Johnny B. Yeah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about me. I'm good. <laughs> I'm here. Johnny V, great job. Great job making us all look good. <laughs> I I try to cover up Terry as much as possible, but there's only so much we can do. <laughs> all right. So, guys, uh, first of all, welcome. Uh, one of the things I want to put out there right away. There was a lot of chatter, a lot of discussion about uh, tees and stats and numbers and all sorts of things, uh, power, um, uh, practice, everything was kind of thrown around in this last weekend. And we thought it was the best way to get at it was a little bit of a roundtable discussion about how we want to address having the most competitive but fair but fun but exciting uh, way to have the women golfers uh, portrayed out there, if that's a fair way to put it. And Jen, I'm going to start with you a little bit. This weekend, uh, you and I both, we were at the Shelly Sharp Memorial presented by Spinners on the Green, and there were some new tees that you weren't necessarily expecting. And then when you right, got no. to them, uh, they, were a li- they were a surprise. And I, and I think it's – I'm going to lead by saying I think it's fair to say – uh, that the new tees that were there, there's maybe a, one of the challenges was that you were told a little late about them, but besides that, um, you you weren't a fan of all of them. And I was hoping you would elaborate on some of that. How about you? You were supposed to play in two. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> I don't throw as far as you. <laughs> yeah, the guys deferred to play them. Um, they were supposed to play them too. Yeah, we were told on the whole one, and that's frustrating. But that's a whole different point. That's yep. that's really that's really not part of it. Um, it's I think like the memorial courses, Vista more than Fountains is you know one of those courses that we go when we play on tour that we're excited for the long distance because I I feel like all the women, not just the long throwers, we can um, compete with the men more fairly because they're throwing up shots too. So um, I always feel like our ratings are a little bit better on courses like that. And um, if they're going to take all that away, it's, it's going to be kind of frustrating. But I, like I said, my post, um, my point of view is probably a little different than some of the, the open women um, because it's just my hobby. So, because what? For 20 years, I've always. It's more of just a hobby. Okay. Um, I have a full, I have a full time job. I play for the love of the game, 
and um, I have a full job and played for 20 years competing with the men, um, challenged by the men and learning by the men right alongside them. So um, my point of view is maybe a little more different than some of the newer upcoming players. I have a puppy to keep me calm. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's to throw Steve off his game right there. <laughs> it always does. And again, I and, and I know a lot of people may think we're we're certainly not here to pit any one person against another. Uh, I, oh, we I need to change all my graphics then. <laughs> we, we really, <laughs> we really just wanted an open conversation about this. And and Steve and I talked about it as as this came up. We didn't feel it would be fair for for instance just to have to Steve of the Pro Tour to join us because I feel like okay, well, great, we've got three guys sitting around trying to figure out what the best way well, is we to interact with women. Like it's just that hasn't been working. <laughs> so having you here was so paramount to that, um, Steve. Last year, you were in a lot of talks with, with the likes of Paige, with the likes of Madison and Katrina Sarah. and Sarah Hokum. W where did some of the shorter tea conversation come about? Well, well, first of all, let me just say hello to Jennifer. It's great to see you again. Hi. And, uh, and Terry, I, I know that you didn't want to pit this as a, as a one versus one kind of deal. I think we agreed it was going to be a three-on-one where we all attack Jennifer <laughs> <Women. non-stop. laughs> <laughs> gonna. <laughs> I'm glad I started doing push-ups again. Um, but uh, I actually don't even remember what your your question was. How did this come about? Yeah, how did the the, the you know when when I think Sarah was really one of the main champions to bring this forward and some you know thinking on your part. How did the whole, you know, different tees and competitiveness, how did that conversation even start last year? Well, uh, as I told Jennifer a few days ago, it actually started with my mom. Um, <laughs> my, my mom plays, Maple, she just started playing Maple Hill. Uh, she's in her early 70s. She started playing. She can throw 150 to 200 feet. And when she gets a three, she's super duper excited. And that's, it's awesome that, that that's the case. But for her, the game is totally different because she throws basically every shot as far as she can. And I, I thought to myself, she should, if she wants to play the same game that I'm playing, there are times when she should throw a, a mid range and not throw it as far and try to have theoretical distance control. Um, and so that that stack up a whole concept started in my mind. Uh, Sarah was already all 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 over it. And and I'm sure some of the other women and and men and other people all over the planet were all over it. But that's when it, it became aware to me, uh, just in that conversation with my mom last summer. Um, and then uh, as the thought developed, I was talking with Josh uh, Lichty over at UDISC, and he said he basically said the exact same thing. And he said there are some holes, um, at, at hole six at Fiesta, for example. He said. Nobody in the entire field of women reached circle two. Nobody had even sniffed a birdie. And he said, the hole is just too long. It's like a 500-foot par three. And the women throw it 400 feet and then throw a 100-foot upshot. And it's it's a really boring three for all of the women. And the hole should either be 380 feet or 530 feet and make it either a challenging three or four. And give the women a, a reason to to go for it and and take that opportunity to to try to get a birdie and and maybe bring the opportunity of bogey into play because they're playing more aggressively. So, so that that's that's where the theory came in. And so from there, last year you had orig you right away started talking about some different tees at different events and who was all in part of that conversation? Be Sarah and others. Uh, no, that was that conversation. The original conversation was primarily the UDIS guys and myself coming up with a bunch of uh, holes that that were statistical, statistically not challenging for the women, um, or, or I should say, not challenging for the vast majority of the women. Uh, what we did was, if uh, I think it was twelve percent or less reach circle two in regulation, then we decided that hole probably should be tweaked because. There, it's it's not it's not challenging the women in the proper way. Um, 
the real goal here is to make the game accessible to more women so that more women can have success and will start playing the game. The, the women's side of the game is a big movement this year and, and last year, but there's a significant push this year. The PDGA is actually helping us in, in other ways, not this women's tea initiative is, is all pro tour. Um, but they're, they're behind us trying to make the women's side of the game grow. And this is just another concept that we have trying to bring more women into the game, make it more accessible. Jen, uh, I was going to say, Jen, Yes. Would, would would go ahead and say I think what I think you're 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 thinking about is <laughs> are, are are you is he punishing I, or is this concept punishing the women that happen to throw far? Um I just look at it as we they're changing the courses for the men to make them harder and harder. They're not shortening the holes for the men and getting it to where all the men can make it to. Not all the guys can throw as far as Simon and Eagle and Paul and all those guys. There's a lot of the guys we throw further than. And so um, it, I look at it, and I don't play all the tournaments. I've never played Vibram. I heard the changes there were good. Um, but it looks like to me on our national tours, on our big events, they are changing the courses to be challenging and hard, and that's good because that's what people want to see. Um, to make them harder for the men and then shorten them for the women to make them easier, to me, seems a little off. Um, yes, I think it'd be great to shorten courses for the women um, on certain tournaments, but on our big major events where people are coming out to watch us, you know, showcase our best skills that we have. I don't know if throwing 200, 250 foot shots are going to do that. Is it, uh, is it an issue with the, the number of holes that they shortened particularly? Is it an issue with are the we talking about last weekend or are we talking about like in general? I'm, I'm thinking, in, uh, well, I'll, I'll start with this weekend because obviously you can't address other courses that you haven't been, that you particularly haven't been to, but right. it, it, for, let's, I'm just we'll, speak. I was going to say, for the, for the memorial, there's a few signature holes out there. We'll take, uh, I believe, hole, hole 18 was shortened for at Vista for your division. Um, really short. Yeah. Really short. And is it <laughs> is it more so an issue with the number of holes they've shortened, the particular holes that they've shortened? Because uh, we'll just take your or viewpoint from this past weekend. Or, or is it yeah. is the fact that they're just shortening them in general? Well, not... Not all the changes last weekend were bad. Hole 11 was perfect. Um, I think it made it fair for men and women. They moved us directly the same um, shot, directly in front of the team, maybe 100 feet. I'd have to look at the, the caddy book. Um, but they moved it up. It made it fair and even. Um, 15 wasn't a horrible change, um, except for change shot. We were far left. We were put you along the OBs and a double mando. Um, so the shot was more of like a spike hyzer, a long spike hyzer around versus um, probably making it pretty challenging for our lefties, our forehand, you know, forehand girls. That's going to be a challenging shot where the original tee is pretty kind of open either way, left or right. Um, and so 15 limited us on that side. Um, what was frustrating, I think, too, was that, again, I played for all these years from the long tee pads with the men, and not only did we get downgraded um, to a shorter pad, but we bypassed the AM pads, and we went from throwing the open pad, skipping the AM pad, and getting our own ladies pad, and so, um, and not a gold, blue, red, I mean, we were just for the ladies, and even one girl was told she couldn't play intermediate men um, because she she didn't want to play with the intermediate women. She had played longer than them. She'd been playing advanced. So she was going to play intermediate men. And I uh, was told, no, she had to throw from the ladies' packs with the other ladies. So um, this weekend, I think, was a little unique. I think it had Steve's um, plan, but was maybe tweaked the wrong way a little bit. So I don't want to say that this was Steve's idea and it was totally horrible because that's not true. 
Well, well so, and also um, we want to throw out, you know, this is, I, I haven't spoken to Keith recently whatsoever, the tournament director. This is also not meant as a, hey, let's all get around and, and you know, bash Keith and spinners and everything that they did in in terms of, yeah, and none of us are, are trying to project that either. I want to make that very clear. Uh, what is great is that Keith was, in a sense, he was certainly trying to take these holes and he was trying to make the adjustments, but I think you, you could paraphrase by saying uh, or sum it up by saying maybe some of those adjustments weren't spot on, um, but they were a change and, and they need to be tweaked more. Yes. Um, yes, the am men maybe throw better than us or maybe score better than us, but it just felt um, a step in the wrong direction of where we want to progress women. This golf, we're trying to, you know, put us in a better stance, but yet then we're stepping back and saying, no, you're not even as good as the AMs. You know, we want you to throw a hundred feet shorter than the AMs. And that was a little hurtful for someone who's been playing for so long. Um, uh, hole nine was one, it was a good hole. It wasn't like a horrible hole, but it was one that the AMs fell on top and they moved us all the way to the bottom. Um, so that was one that, you know, I don't know why we couldn't throw with the AMs on top if they're going to shorten us. And then um, 18 was definitely, 18 and was 12 the damn hole? I'd have to look. Yeah. Yep, 12 is. Um, 18 and 12 was probably the worst. You know, moving us shorter than all of them. Um, 18 was not a horrible hole. I think all women can make it across the water. It's 150 feet. They went from a great, beautiful finishing hole to we literally threw putters. I birdied it with a putter the first time. The last two times, um, we had a bunch of spectators watching us, and I felt really sad for him that we were just throwing putter up shots. So I threw a fiber that skipped in the water, big spike hyzer just to give him something to watch. I threw a gator in the water. That went too long. Um, Colleen threw her putter 100 feet long and out of bounds. And so 18 didn't even um, – I think our scores are worse this year than last year um, just because – and one, we were probably just goofing off and mad. We were going to jump putt it. Um, so <laughs> it was. Uh, well, but there was I, scoring I separation. <laughs> no, I, 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 <laughs> so we're we we're, we're going to. We're going to let Steve talk here in a second uh, as a follow-up, but I, I can understand where you're coming from on a couple of aspects, especially I can see how it might be insulting to for some to say that, oh, yes, here, here, here's the MPO pad. Here's the we'll say the am or advanced pad. And then here's the pro women's pad, which is the shortest when th th we've Again, said, we, we've said on, we've said pad. on this a, a number of times that there's that the women, a lot of the FPL women compete with the advanced men at a regular, at, at a regular pace. A lot of them, not all of them. Some clearly of them. there's, there's a, a, a top portion of that. And also there are a few, I can understand there being a few, we'll say signature holes that, that really it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it could be a kick to the stomach when you walk up that and you see this great shot that, but then you don't get to throw that particular shot on some holes. And there are some holes out at, out at Vista that do you play disc golf for beauty. Sometimes the, <laughs> with the way my scores are, I have to play for something. <laughs> so I can, under, I can understand that it would be almost like hole one at uh, Vibram playing in front of the pond is the way I would look at it. Like that, that's, that takes a little bit of stuff out. So Steve, go ahead. You're, you're up on One the... of my questions. Oh, okay. What we're going to do with these holes. I mean, do we still get to throw the signature holes or are we going to, like, say, Dela? And I know you don't run Dela. The top, I mean, I was on, I got to be on the picture this year. Like, that signature hole would not have happened, like, this picture, if, if we don't get to throw it. You know, there's so many big signature holes. Are we not even going to have the opportunity to throw? Because now we're not good enough is what it felt like last weekend so and to so, yeah, uh, totally got busted on the vibram on uh it should be called the mvp uh, open every time one of anyone <laughs> it's says a, vibram you gotta put a dollar dollar in, the, in the swear jar and it all goes to and the uh, fpo division it's up to like 300 dollars. it goes to the fpo at the mvp open right yes yep Okay, good, because I'm not adding any money to that division, so we really need something. <laughs> Don't joke, Steve. <laughs> all right, all right. All right. Um, but 
what I heard Jennifer say was fantastic because she and I are almost in exact agreement, which is going to make this, the rest of this conversation boring. Um, well, I'm under the impression there were five holes changed, uh, and we jo Josh Lichty from UDISC sent me a um, a list which I forwarded to Keith, and I said these five holes have very few women sniffing birdies. And we want to give them an opportunity to be aggressive on these holes. Um, I, I thought he moved the tee on hole nine to the am pad. No, we went shorter, way shorter. Okay. Which, so, which I would still argue the am pad would generate a lot of threes, but go on. Uh, yeah. it, it would, it would generate threes and it would generate the opportunity for twos as well. And I got a two on nine. From, well, from the short tee. From, from I, I'm just saying, from the shortest tee, you got a two from there. Yeah. I worry that if, and I might be dead wrong, but I worry if we move the women's division to what was considered the AMT on nine, I seriously worry it would generate almost exclusively all threes. I really think that's, and that's I think that's what would happen. Yeah, that's what my question is this. If we move all these up, now we somewhat feel like, we can't throw, you know, with the men, and then we're all getting the exact same score. Well, that's um, the I, well, the the point isn't the. I mean, the point is to give you similar shots as the men, um, and not distance wise, but so that you're not throwing drivers on every on every tee box and giving you opportunities for more twos to help with the scoring separation. Now, that particular hole is, like as Terry said, I wasn't there, so I didn't get a chance to see it. He's saying that. There, almost nobody's going to take a two there. Virtually impossible. That more there's going to be almost all threes. So that that particular hole is uh, is is we'll, we'll, we could say a little questionable as far as where the where even maybe the AMs should be shooting from. Sorry, Steve. Go on. I think we change them, and then we don't get a change really in our scores. Do you know what I mean? Like. Um, and then the guys were throwing drivers and we're throwing putters. So if we're supposed to be dropping down to throwing the same disc, we're not. They changed the but, hole so much that it was a totally different shot. But the argument is that, there, yes, you'll be throwing putters on those holes, but there are holes that they're throwing putters on that you are throwing drivers on. I think that's, I think that's the argument. Steve? So just to, to continue through... Uh, I was under the impression the women played from the AMT, which would have been, in my opinion, correct on nine. Uh, I'm glad to hear you like the change on 11, because uh, yeah. because I I think they did a good job on that. Uh, hole 12 was, uh, in my opinion, clearly too short. Um, and this was Keith and I before the tournament didn't talk about where these tees should go. We just talked about the fact that. Okay, these tees are too long, and in general, we want to make them 75 to 80 percent of the distance of whatever the men are throwing. We want that to be the, the, what the women throw, and I I can talk about why that's the case later. But so hole 12 was clearly made too short. I think that needs to just go to the AM tee and make it an aggressive shot over the water, still pretty, and still and introduce the idea of a birdie as opposed to making it something that only a, a very small number of people, women, can, can birdie. But hole 15. A lot of men lay up. I mean, there's so many men that lay that shot up, too. So why, I mean, I don't know. We sit, you, That hole gets backed up, and you stand there and you watch. We watched, like, four groups tee off, and only a few guys threw over. There was a lot of the men that laid up. On, so, on hole, we're talking about hole 12? 12, mm-hmm. So I'm throwing. I'm showing it's as, it's 360 uh, uphill, yes. and you have to have about a 350-ish effective pull just to to clear the OB. Yeah, to to me that's a a fantastic challenge for the men. They, if you're playing an MPO, you better be able to throw 350, and if you're playing an FPO, you better be able to throw 275. That's that that's my opinion of those those sort of minimum distances, and in my opinion, that's a great challenge for the men and the women at, at those respective distances. And I'm I'm guessing that the AMT is about 275 based on my conversations with Keith. 282. That's okay. I'll take it. Um, and then uh, hole 15, uh, Jennifer, I'll agree with you. That hole was a little bit too short, but not a lot too short. And maybe the angle was funny. I wasn't there. But what I told him was move that 
move that tee back about 100 feet, make it about 550, and give the women, if if you've got the distance, you're going to throw that 400, 450, and your upshot is super easy. you got the easy three. If you don't have that big distance, your upshot is really challenging. So that's a that's a perfect example of a good distance par four, in my opinion, as opposed to this 750-foot shot that is just two massive bombs, and a lot of women can't even get there with that. So, uh, and, and if you do have that distance, trying to do that controlled twice in a row, you're not going to get a significant advantage. So actually shortening it makes having distance more advantageous. So I, I think, again, we're in agreement on that. And hole 18, he changed it to 200 feet. I told him to make it to 120 feet because I want to <laughs> see those jump putts off the tee. <laughs> We tried. We were trying. Is there a Terry? Is there a sarcasm font here? I want people to like. Is there a way to know? Well, so here's the know? problem, Steve. Is is as much as I, as well as I know you and Johnny and a few others. Not everyone gets your humor. I love it. <laughs> I absolutely love it and adore it. The problem is sometimes More. it's missed, and that's no. when you get hate mail from the Pro Tour channel because sometimes <laughs> that stuff is missed. I, I, and but I, I do love it. I, I just I, want to be on record. I, I understand. Like, I would personally, I hate to see hole 18 change for the FPO at, at Vista, just because if if there is an oppor- if there is an option to lay up to be able to take a three over that water, and I, I don't know what that distance is. If it's 180 feet to yeah, get over the, to clear the water, 150, 180. That then personally, it, it's. I hate seeing signature holes change, and to me, that is one of them. Um, I'm not opposed to shortening other holes or link. I wouldn't say lengthening, but shortening or or slightly adjusting. But there, there is a there there is you. I do understand the the qualms there. So on hole 18, um, which is 381 feet, uh, one woman got inside circle two on that hole uh, at in the last round of the memorial last year. Um. And in my opinion, that's that's not enough. Now, I'll agree with you, Johnny. If it's a signature hole and you can't do anything, like because the, the tee is right up on the water, because, I mean, you really can't do anything. But what basically every woman did was cut that short. And they threw 250 to 300, and then they had a 100-foot upshot. And it's a relatively boring three for the women, mm-hmm. except for one, maybe two women who could try to pump it. Um, but if they're... If they have any kind of lead at that point, they're not going to risk that. Um, what I recommended to Keith was go to the right of Duck Island there and make it about a 300-foot shot. The entire left side is, has water. There's water on the entire left side. And make it – and what I actually also said was perhaps we put a little OB wall there. So you got to clear it maybe 200, 250 feet. No, not that much. 200 feet. There's a sidewalk on the right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, so, I'm talking about connecting that and sort of making a fake pond in front. So you have to clear the wall and get onto a sort of island green, but it's a pretty big island green. Um, but make that shot about a 300-foot shot and so that the women on the final hole have to play with OB on the left and, and potentially some OB short, but they'll all be able to clear it. And then make it a real good challenging finishing hole where there can be a two-stroke swing. Why change it, though? Uh, because... Yeah, sure. at, at, because only I mean, one like, woman got inside circle two. That's what he's saying. Yeah. I know. That's the last hole. Why make it different and make it not look like the golf course just just for us to get 50 feet closer? So, so that there's an opportunity for the women to birdie that hole. Because right now, with that distance and the water, the women are not attacking that hole. And what we want to do is we want to encourage the women to be aggressive so that we can see all of their amazing skills. Because right of, now, the skills are not being showcased because there's no real significant advantage. The risk is so much bigger than the reward. And here's here's something from one of our favorite <laughs> smashies uh, on the board. And this might be a little bit more logistically difficult, but for one hole, why not add a different basket? for the fpo division shorten bring the basket itself 50 feet shorter and 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 see if they can play and then when the fpo the final fpo group comes in you roll the basket off or whatever you do perfect 
then they're still playing from the <laughs> then they're playing from the T pad and this and that. And I don't want to get as someone says we're getting very specific into these this particular course, which is what we have as a, as a as a general generality. And we'll hopefully expand the conversation a little bit after we get through this. But Steve, so uh, we did that exact same thing on at Maple Hill on two or three of the holes. Mm -hmm. It worked perfectly. We just had somebody following the lead women, and whenever they were done, they lifted up that basket and just carted it off into the woods. Um, we talked about doing that exact thing, I think, on hole three at Fountain, which is, again, probably about another 380, 400-foot hole. With, there's like a little pavilion in front of it to the left, and the road is off to the right behind it. That's a short hole. <laughs> Everything's relative, Jennifer. And then <laughs> talked about bringing that, bringing that pin back about 40 to 50 feet. And instead of – because you can't – again, you can't move that tee – unless you have the women teeing off from some, like on the mm -hmm. road itself, which would just look horrible. Um, and so moving the pin forward. Uh, it's really interesting to me that when I talked with Keith yesterday, we didn't think about that on hole 18 because it would work so perfectly. It would work, you know, you put that pin off to the right and just make it a 300 foot shot clearing the water. I love it. I think that's a much better solution. Well, thanks, Tired of Crap, for bringing that up. He's one of our favorite Smashies. So. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, <laughs> All right. So uh, one, of the, one of the very fair challenges uh, or, or uh, criticism or challenge. Wait, wait, wait. No, Terry, no, no, no. Jennifer, uh, before, yeah. Terry, before Terry gets going, I want to hear what you have to say. But before Terry gets going, we've talked about making five changes on Vista. With the with the last one being a new pin, so you still get to have that exciting throw over the water. Are you happy with those five changes? Um, can, so there was uh, two other women who played this weekend who throw just as far. They, I think Terry would um, agree with me that those women can crush a disc probably four hundred feet. Don't you think, Terry? I don't Did you watch think them? I don't think with pinpoint accuracy. Uh, Consistently, they can throw the throw the disc very far. But as they well. can and both so throw far, like yeah. Yeah, um, I think all of us kind of felt. Let me try to find some notes. That is it. Hole ten. I mean, I think some of the holes we felt like, man, I would like one just a little bit shorter here, but we don't need one here. So I think we felt a little, a few different holes. So um, I, I look at hole ten. And 40% uh, of the women on hole 10 got in circle two in in regulation. Oh, no, that's all eight. I'm sorry. Hole 10, 33%. And uh, I'll agree with you that that hole could be shortened. Just a little bit, not a but, lot. Mm -hmm. But, but not for, not when, I, when, I, when I look at this, part of, and I, I, had the, I have this conversation with Sarah earlier, um, in my ideal world, I think we should change 16 of the 18 holes, but some of them we should only move forward 20 or 30 feet. Yeah. So, so while I think that's what we should do, you've got to be a little realistic because we can't. We, we're not going to install new tees on all of these holes, and what we're doing right now is it's the 80-20 principle. We're we're doing 20% of the work and solving 80% of the problem, and I'll agree with you 100%. Basically, every hole could be just a little bit shorter, or in some cases, a lot shorter if they're like a long par four. Um, so what we're doing with these five holes in particular, and with the seven holes that we're recommending for Fountain, is we're attacking the holes that 12% or less, or less of the women are hitting circle two. Um, there are some holes where it's 20%, like hole two at Vista. Oh, no. Um, hole six. Hole, hole 15 and and... No, I've got got my columns wrong. Sorry, hole 13 and 16 would be the next two that we would attack at Vista. Because um, that's the one in five is reaching circle two. And those are, that that's just a really low number. And it, it discourages women being aggressive. And we want to encourage women to be aggressive because that's what makes disc golf fun to watch. And, and cool, cool. Oh, go ahead. There. I was just saying, I was looking at Sarah's numbers, and it just seemed like some of the holes that the women seemed to struggle more on were not the holes moved, yet some of the easier holes, like hole 18, only 30% got bogeys. 
But yeah, there was holes that 70% of us got bogeys, 65% of us got bogeys, you know, and th those holes weren't changed. So I think that's kind of what we felt like, man, why did they change this and not this? And so, so I think it just, that's, um, there's, there's two, there's two things going on there. The first is on hole 18, when you say 30% got bogeys, why did they bother changing it? You're absolutely right. 70% got pars. The 30% the the thirty percent that got bogeys missed an extra putt, mm -hmm. and when you so that's they're everybody's playing the hole exactly the same. They just missed a twenty foot putt instead of hitting it, and that's <laughs> that is what that is. But I don't think we want to test people's two hundred foot upshot games. That's that's not what we're looking to test. Uh, horribly, that is what that hole tested this year at Shelley, but um, that isn't the goal, and. With these holes where people are averaging well above par, um, give me. Can you give me an example of one of those? Uh, hole six was one. Yeah, that's exactly the one I was looking at. So hole six is really interesting because one third of the people, one third of the women, get to circle two in regulation, and yet the average score is is one. It's one above par. So is there OB on that hole? Is there something tricky about that hole? <laughs> all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's o, there's OB on all the holes. Yeah, I mean, there's OB left and right, and the fairway narrows, and then it's 750 feet mm -hmm. with a, you know, kind of a, uh, an awkward tee shot. Well, I mean, a little bit of a turnover tee shot, and then a relatively well, narrow well, second and or third shot. I was, I was going to say, do, do we want to expand this conversation just a little bit beyond the memorial? Do we want to Do we want to think yeah. about... Uh, m m potential so, uh, potential for other me, courses like Steve. Do you have? Uh, I want to finish. I want to okay. finish that whole six just to okay. just so we're all in a good spot and maybe relatively comfortable with with why we did what we did, um, or why we recommended what we recommended. Um, on whole six, it, there's. OB, I'm going to guess that the the scoring average is so high because of all of that OB, and it's a par four, so you have basically two big drives. That are yes. affecting and and they can go they can go wild so i'll agree that would be part of the second level of of changes but when we look at circle two and one third of the women are reaching circle two in regulation yeah we you know that that's okay there's there are much worse holes to attack as far as women not reaching circle two in regulation and i focus on circle two in regulation because that to me says if you're inside circle two in regulation, you have an opportunity for a birdie. And if you're not inside there, you realistically don't have an opportunity for birdie. So if you can't get in circle two in regulation, you're not going to play aggressive. And the risks are, of playing aggressive are much bigger than the rewards of playing aggressive. And the goal is to try to balance those out. And that's that that's just a conceptually why why I look at circle two and circle one in regulation, and so when your 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 thoughts on six are absolutely accurate, but it would be part of the second tier of this. I thought also what was really interesting that Sarah figured out was that when we did have a chance for birdie, only twelve to thirty percent got them. <laughs> so I don't know so much about the driving, but women don't putt as good as men. And, and I think Paige dominated last year more, not because she was driving further, but she's putting so much better. So I don't know if it's the distance as much as our putting is just, you know, we don't score as often because of our putting is not as good. Especially so that's a, that's a perfect segue to Johnny's point, which is, um, I, don't, I don't actually know what you were going to say, but I think, <laughs> I think you Neither were headed I. towards... I think you were headed towards making this this conversation bigger, a little more generic. And, yes. Yeah, we're 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 focusing on the memorial and specific holes, and there's not everyone that follows those holes. Um, maybe I'll put a a little advisor in at the beginning of the podcast. And say, hey, get out your Vista map for this one. But <laughs> but but yeah, uh, what Steve? What to you makes I would say makes a good hole for an MPO or an FPO player? Is it? how close they can get to the hole, circle one, circle two, what percentage, and, you know, does, uh, I mean, like Jen had said, we we all know that, unfortunately, for most of the FPL players, putting is 
the, the one of the weaker spots in the game. They don't putt as hard or as far, which makes it more difficult. You know, they're they're hitting way fewer circle two putts than most of our average men. Sure. Um, and what what the goal? My the big goal that I have here is uh, when when a and I, again, I'm only concentrating on MPO and FPO, and I have to throw that caveat in because people always come back at me and say, I'm a 60-year-old man, and I can't throw 400 feet. And I say, "That's I understand. You should play from the tees that make the game fun for you. And uh, But for MPO and FPO, the average MPO guy can throw maybe, maybe 400, maybe 450, and the average MPO girl can throw uh, 275 to 350. And Jennifer, we're talking averages here. So... Um, then, so when, when I look at that, I say, okay, there's a there's a 75 to 80 percent difference in distances. When the men are throwing from their, uh, are we all good? Yeah. Okay, my screen's starting to do funny things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, when uh, when the men are throwing and they have 18 tee shots, realistically, probably nine of those tee shots are going to be big distance drives. And probably five of those tee shots are going to be fairway drives, and four of those tee shots are going to throw mids off the tee. And when you look at the exact same holes that women are throwing, they're going to throw all of the big distance drives are going to be big distance drives plus a silly upshot. The controlled drives that men are doing are going to be big distance drives for the women. So they're throwing the nine big distance drives plus the five control drives. So they're throwing 14 big distance drives, and then the mids are going to be control drivers for the women. Mm -hmm. And what I want to do is I want the women to be able to enjoy the same game that the men are playing. The game needs to be more accessible to women so that they can feel comfortable stepping up and playing in the pro levels. Right now, realistically, if I'm a, if I'm a, a pretty good whim, women's player, I'm not going to step up unless I can throw 400. And you're oh. cutting, you're cutting mm -hmm. off so many women from what if you want to be a you want to travel as a woman? Oh, if no. you want, if you you're right. I unless think unless you're Sarah Holcomb. I, I she's, think she's is the one exception. I, I well Sarah has I, it, Sarah's awesome cuz she's got forehand and backhand nailed down. Uh I mean she's got one of each. I mean her backhand as yeah. she'll work on that. Don't worry. <laughs> as she tells us. Um I don't think 400 is is realistic for most FPO players. I think you're looking more along 300. I, I think for most FPO players if if you if you can throw 300 consistently, you will cash in virtually every FPO division or FPO event. If you can throw 400, that's why Cat and Page and Jen and Sarah can uh We'll say dominate the divisions. That's why we see the so, huge soaring scoring separation. So let's let's I look at. Agree. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. No, that, no, that's that's good. I'm glad you disagree. Doing doing that same. Okay, that's. Do you disagree with the number four hundred, Jen? I disagree with that. I mean, I I think there's a lot of women that are are throwing the disc further and further, and I think we're doing that because we're challenged to do it. Mm -hmm. So you know. But we're, we're, let's let's look at this. We're, I I mentioned the four hundred level for for women, and everybody disagreed and said that was too far. What if you can throw four hundred as a man? You're you're on the lower end of what it, what is expected, mm -hmm. and and that actually makes my point, which is the men are, can throw and do throw farther on average. So when when you approach a hole, uh, a 400 foot hole, some men are throwing control drivers. Some, if you can't throw that far on your guy, you're throwing your distance driver. Some men are throwing mid ranges on that. If you can throw 600, what? How far do you throw? A 280 straight as a string. <laughs> Every time. Um, I measured it too. Good. So, so if you can throw 600 feet. And the hole's 400, and you're throwing a mid. You have a significant advantage already, not not only on that hole because you're throwing a mid range versus a distance driver, but then on the next hole, which is 600 or 700 feet, and it's a par four. You have another big advantage there. So distance is always going to be an advantage, in my opinion. Right now, in the women's side of the game, it's too big of an advantage. On average, 
the men are throwing one third of their shots or big distance shots. Um, one sixth of their shots are controlled and, and, and mids control, fair, control fairway drivers and mids and half their shots are putts for the women. Those numbers, I got them over here. Just got to scroll to the right. For the women, it's over 40% of their shots are big distance shots. And that's that's too many. We're, we're emphasizing that too much. What I'd like to do is shorten these tees, have the women play the same game that the men are playing. Then the women still have to concentrate on their distance, but it's not as overwhelming an advantage if you have the distance. You need to concentrate on your putting. You need to concentrate on your controlled upshots and mids as well. Those two aspects of the game become more important. Women become better golfers overall, and the game becomes more fun to watch because we've got more risk and reward. So done. Do, do we pick courses for short birdie opportunities? I mean, these big national tours and these big events, we're trying to design these long, hard, challenging courses. And I feel like, you know, why do the men get to play all these long, challenging holes, but then we're going to shorten them to where the women can get a birdie. And I, and I say that because I guess I read a lot of twos on talking about us, women getting twos, women getting twos. Well, the men don't get twos on anything. Uh, I, this I, nothing. Oh, I just, I was going to say, I just, well, not maybe not twos, but birdies. Look at the number of birdies most of our top MPO players get. They're, they're pushing. Oh, they're like four, four, fives. Yeah, you're, you're shooting 45, 40, 49, 43, you know, yeah. at, at Memorial, you, it wouldn't shock me to see someone dip maybe 39. I agree. I mean, the men shoot way under, but there's still a winner and a loser. But I look at it as who shot the, the least amount of throws. Of, of course. I, I mean, that's, that's how we determine I our winners. <laughs> that's that's what, how we determine our winners, Jen. We know that. I, I think... Ultimately, I think we 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 need to make sure that we need to make sure that the the that whatever changes are made to courses are I don't want to say agreed upon, but that are at least double checked and overlooked by multiple people, preferably someone that is maybe playing in that division. So so we try not to have oversights. Sorry, ah, daughter. And it's okay. And and on top of that, I think that having the women score more birdies is important. More birdies, as we all know, equals more fun, but will maybe help bring in larger FPO divisions rather than because I'll tell you what, as as a as a bad MPO player my male myself, I have zero interest in going out and playing a course that's eleven thousand, twelve thousand feet. I will turn away from it. And I have a feeling that a lot of FPL players that are in my position will do the same when they look at a course that's 10,000 or 9,000 feet. When you get, when you start looking at, we'll say seven, 8,000 feet, that's probably looking a little bit more appealing to them. And that will help. And to my opinion, I think that will help grow the sport and push all the FPL players up. But I, maybe, maybe Jen has a different. I agree with that as, Taking a course to go play casually. We're talking about courses that we're playing for professional major events. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you get? I mean, like, no, yeah, I, I want to go shoot this. Longer doesn't mean better. For, yeah, we we saw we saw that at the Saint personally, and I, I'm going to go on a limb. We saw that at the Saint Jude a couple of years ago event. Longer, like Terry said, longer doesn't always mean better. And I I, I thought that always. course was kind of boring, particularly and to to watch someone have to throw two or three shots. Or two, I'll say even the MPO watching him have to crush two or three wide open boring drives to me on one hole is ugh honestly and and I feel like for a lot of the holes that's what we watch FPL players do we watch them throw two full it's I'll say it's very rare to watch a, a male player have to throw two full drives and that's not uncommon with the FPO division I think and that no, that's not. That's that's what I see. Steve, you're raising a finger. Yeah, I have to go to the bathroom. Okay. Um, no, <laughs> the, uh, Jennifer, I love your point that we shouldn't like on a casual course. Sure, I'm happy playing a 200 foot hole because that's what I'm doing. And I'm when I'm playing a pro tour event, I don't want to play a 200 foot hole. 
Hallelujah. I, I agree 90%. Um, and the only reason I don't agree 100% is because there's going to be tunnel shots. There's going to be island greens. There's, there's going to be some, you know, some little things. And those are testing a different skill. And in my opinion, if you have a 200, 240 foot tunnel shot onto an island green, men and women are playing that same tee. I, I don't want the men playing a 400 foot shot through a tight tunnel onto an island green. That's silly. Um, cause only I could hit it. But, uh, so to, to that point, I don't think we're arguing about should the 200 foot holes be included, what we're arguing. And I don't think we're arguing actually, I think we agree because the five changes that we proposed to the Vista course, I think we're in agreement on. And then you actually said maybe hole six and 10 could be changed as well. I don't think 18 should be changed. Okay, so we disagree on hole 18. I want to take hole 18 from 380 feet and make it 300 feet. I love moving the pin and making it still be a, a shot over the water that's really fun to watch. So, but because what I'm going to do there is I'm going to be, I'm going to encourage, not force. I'm going to encourage <laughs> you to go for the birdie. You're already going for the birdie. I want everybody to go for the birdie. You're going to go for it with a mid or a fairway. These other girls are going to go for it. Other women are going to go for it with a distance driver. You you obviously have an advantage because you can throw farther. But now I'm encouraging more people to go for the birdie, which is which is going to cause excitement. I don't want them to bail off way right and just do an easy pitch and putt and get the three. And what what I'm afraid of, and it felt like last week was we were going to make all these changes. We were going to have to throw from different tees, but we're still going to get the same score. So it didn't change our score any. We still shot the same score. So on we still shot from different tees. So, so on hole on hole eleven, you don't think the women scored better? Hole eleven. Um, I didn't look. I mean, Colleen took a six the last round. <laughs> you know, I took a six on twelve. I went over over out of bounds twice trying to get it to stick there because it's a spike. Kaiser or putter shot. Um, I'm going to guess it, in general, if you take a hole that's 760 feet and you make it 600 feet, scores are going to get better. Yes, there's a lot of OB out there. So and, it, sure. And I'll also guess that if you take a 760 foot hole and make it 600 feet, you're going to encourage women to be more aggressive and try to get that birdie three. As opposed to saying, I don't have a chance at the three. I'm just going to go 280, 280, 280, and then drop in my 10 foot putt. So I'm we want. Okay with the long ones. I'm okay with the long ones. I take all the 350, 375 foot shots being taken down even shorter. So but we've been used to throwing long holes. The, the holes that were changed uh, were. 480, 760, 360, 750, and 380. So uh, the 350 is hole 12. Oh, that's the over the water one. That's you clearing. It takes 325 to clear the water. So I am actually good with that one changing because a, a 325 foot water clear for the women's division, I think, is too much. Uh, bring it down to 275. Um, and then the final hole. I'll agree that's if of those five, that's the tweener. But in my opinion, it should be shortened. So we're it was just hard for us dealing with the changes last second. We we dealt with them on whole T one. <laughs> um, seeing those really short changes made, making us T worse than the AMs, but then not changing the very difficult holes confused us. So not we are on the changes, we are 80% agreed. You think maybe there's a couple more we should change, which is great to hear because we're going to do that next year. And uh, and I would go ahead and be willing to bet that uh, you don't mind our change on hole 18. <laughs> and I'll see you in five. I'll see you in five weeks. Four weeks. So, so yeah. So but so the but the point here is. Uh, I think that it sounds like there's more difference between us than there really is because Jennifer has a significantly negative imp uh, impression of holes being changed to 200 feet, which is too short. I agree 100%. So I, I think 
the the goal here isn't to change a 10,000 foot course to a 5,000 foot course. It's to change a 10,000 foot course to an 8,000 foot course. They're still, for women, they're still big shots. They're still impressive shots. More people are going to love, there's a lot of people that already love to watch the women play because realistically, it's a much closer game to what AM1 players play. Because uh, I, I can't throw at 600 feet, but I can dream of throwing at 400 or 350. Um, so I can understand that game a little more and maybe it's more enjoyable, but it'd be even more enjoyable if the women were going for it and they showed off their skills. That's what, that's what I, I want to see these women risking shots. Okay. One other question. If we make all these changes, are we going to have just as good a tease for all, as all the men? Same Great fair. question. Not a not a chance. You're going to be teeing off natural gravel. It's probably going to be wavy. Yeah, well, there was there was that there. The, they're going to bring. Yeah. They're, they're bringing in ice rinks for every every hole. We get that out with the poop. It's some, a huge added expense that um, they're skipping. Some marbles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> marbles on ice rinks. Well, no added cash to the FPO. It's all going into the marbles <laughs> on ice rinks. For the tease. So, Jennifer, to to that point, uh, I think it's hole four. Or no, I don't. I get these holes so confused. I think it's hole four at Fountain Hills. Mm -hmm. At Fountain, where I talked about the 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 tee pad is so beautiful there. And if we were going to try to shorten that hole, and it's a four hundred and sixty foot par three, so. It should be shortened by 50 or 60 feet. Uh, it's a little downhill, so it, it's gettable. Um, but there's nowhere to move that T. Mm -mm. So the solution, I think, was to move the pin forward. So the answer to your question is, of course, we're going to be considering the T's. And the women have to have good T's. Uh, worst case scenario would be a rubber mat that's been laid down, and we make sure everything is flat. Um, but realistically, I'd like to avoid that and I'd much rather put a pin in. Yeah. I don't want to personally risk throwing off on a bunch of mats and hurting myself when the men are getting to tee off from concrete. Well, maybe we'll put rubber on their tees too. <laughs> I was, was going to say at least Jen, then all of the women are going to hurt themselves. So it's still fair. <laughs> well, so let, let's. <laughs> Let, let's push let's wow that's so hard to push this Let, let's push the conversation a little bit toward, towards a, a finish line here Steve do you have we'll say plans to speak with the specific TDs or maybe more we'll say more input with other people on top of the TD for these other courses so that maybe we don't run into as many because you're not going to please everybody. I guarantee it. People are going to go to, I know, Terry. We do on Smashbox. We, we just, just look, look at, at the, the chat. chat board. Everybody bitch in. Everybody's happy. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're seeing, oh, we're seeing two different chat boards. So what, what's, what's the plan going forward for the other pro tour events? So the one thing that I should say uh, is I, I should give Jennifer a huge thank you um, because this event, which is not a Pro Tour event, but it's played on a course that the Pro Tour is played on. Mm -hmm. um, this event was put forward as a test. And Keith emailed me and said, Steve, we moved the five T's and it's going to be a great test for the memorial. One of the great thing about tests is if they don't work, you, you can adjust. And Jennifer bringing light to this subject made me realize, uh, wait, these T's might not have been moved the, the correct way. And um, and that was arguably my fault because I did not reach out to Keith and say, just so we know, here's what we're trying to do exactly. So Keith and I had a very long call yesterday or two days. I don't know what day it is, but we had a long call. Oh, it's Smashbox. It's Tuesday. <laughs> we're 25 minutes from hump day. That's right. So. Um, but we had a very long call yesterday, went hole by hole and discussed exactly where the T pads would work. He's going to talk with Dan about the memorial. They're going to get about uh, the fountain and they're going to get back to me. This exact process will happen with Ryan and Joey for Waco. And it'll happen with Brad and Jordan up at 
uh, Jonesboro. And it'll happen with Sean out at San Francisco. Now, San Francisco is going to be interesting because I won't have aerial overviews of each mm -hmm. hole. Sure. On the courses that we've already played, I have aerial overviews oh. as they're talking through it. I can look at the hole and be very precise and say, put it over by that tree on the left. And then they can say, well, that won't work because there's a hornet's nest there or whatever it is. Um, so we'll be able to talk through all this. And because of what Jennifer brought up, and I, I tip my hat, I th sincerely thank you. That that process <laughs> that process is going to be much more detailed than I than it would have been because mm -hmm. yeah. I I put out articles and I presume everybody reads them and knows exactly what I'm thinking about <laughs> and it's not always the case and we're all, we're all going to make mistakes Smashbox is going to make mistakes the Pro Tour is going to make mistakes Never. the the FPO this division is going to make a mistake or two I guarantee it. Um, we, this we, was not a pro tour mistake. No, no, this is a no. But I'm saying they will at some point this year. Um, just that one. Ford Mustang commercial was not. I don't. That was not a mistake. <laughs> that's a whole nother. That's a whole nother podcast. Nailed Steve. it. Um, I thought Steve just made all the changes from numbers, and he was like two point two six seven two seven two percent. Put it there. Steve, well, that, that does sound like Steve a little bit. That does kind of sound like Steve just a little bit. No, I just think we need, obviously, this is great because I people are complaining on the board about, you know, we've made our points. This is much, to me, this conversation that we're having is much better than, than what we sometimes see on social media. And I would rather have two people face-to-face, -face, and I'd rather have it on our show than even anywhere else because why not? It's Tuesday night. So... I think we've made a lot of good points, and I, I trust that Jen is a a very good voice for the FPO division, especially in a course you know so well, like the Memorial, like the Memorial Vista and Fountain. So I'm looking forward to whatever adjustments can be made. I'm not, yeah, I definitely, I was afraid that I was going to be the one that was like, oh, she throws far, so she's totally against all changes. That's not the case. I agree with Sarah. I have talked to, you know, a lot of them too. I'm afraid of drastic changes being made and the courses, and I'm throwing a mid range and a putter on every hole. Um, Which I, would be an advantage to you, by the way. Hmm. Wouldn't no, it not? Okay. Courier, okay. Everyone. Move on. <laughs> but that's not what's exciting to me. That's me personally. That's my personal opinion. I don't want to take off work, leave my kids to go throw putters and mid ranges across mm -hmm. the country. I won't do even that. Even if you won? Um, I love it. Yeah. Even, if those, love even if that was the recipe for you winning every weekend? And the great thing about this conversation is I don't want you doing that either. Good. Good. <laughs> Um, but I do want you throwing your mid off the tee of some holes. About 22.6%. Six, seven. <laughs> Where there's marbles and ice. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. I think I think uh, the, the takeaways are we will continue to talk about, and, and clearly Steve and his numbers and his whole crew of numbers, including UDISC, including the tournament directors, uh, other course designers, including talking to uh, some of the women who are are actively involved. I think maybe this is a somewhat of an open invitation for Jen to be more involved. Uh, obviously, Sarah Holcomb, Paige Pierce, Katrina have been uh, all uh, uh, considered when when some of these changes are taking place. I think it's just what we're coming to the realization is there will be a continued open dialogue. And Steve's, Steve and the Pro Tour and all of the tournament directors are going to continue to try and make the best possible courses that fit the women's games that the women are uh, currently playing. agree with and are, are playing. Yeah. Is, is that a fair summation of, of what we arrived at here tonight, everyone? Lots yes, of words. And, and? I, I do hope you take into consideration all the signature holes. Um, I think it's hurtful being having to step back and not get to play the tough, challenging, signature, beautiful holes that we get to travel the, the world and play. Um, so I hope the signature holes get a little more looked at. And um, like hole one at Fountains, if we move it shorter, I hope that it doesn't turn into an OB shot over and over for other women. But if we were throwing from the original tee, we have more safe, 
you know, it's more of a three. I'm afraid if we move these things shorter, we're going to start getting OB4s on all these holes because they're shorter and they put us at a different angle. I felt that way at OB, um, at GBO last year. We were moved to the side. We had a, a tougher angle. We had a crosswind. The guys had a backstop. All you had to do was throw straight into the backstop on hole one at OB, and they're safe. We had a tougher angle. Well, the nice. And so I hope things. Like I was gonna say the great the great thing I think about the 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 pro tour is I think Steve plans on running it for a few years if, I, if I'm right unless no. you, you plan on taking the money and, not at this rate taking the money and running um, <laughs> uh, so like I said there's going to be mistakes made I guarantee it on everyone's side and what we can do is work as a a group to constructively make the best courses some of the courses we've played or have been playing for 15 or 20 years have gone through multiple adjustments. And it's it's almost as if we need to start looking at the courses slightly differently for certain divisions. And those type of changes are going to, uh, they, they might require a year or two. So I think we, we almost, feedback is going to be important. We just need to make sure that uh, we everyone understands that there will probably be mistakes made. And I'm going to say that a thousand more times this year because I'm going to make a lot of mistakes. So I want to make sure I tell everyone everyone's making mistakes. We heard your disclaimer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, I, I'll just close. Uh, Jennifer, thank you very much for the input. Uh, whole, 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 one at, whole one at Fountain is on the second year list for changes. It's not getting changed this year. But I think it should be looked at once we've adjusted some other holes. I appreciate you saying that you heard about the changes at Maple Hill. We changed 11. There were 11 different holes for the women at Maple Hill. Uh, and Paige complained about one of them. And nobody else complained about any. So it was it was universally enjoyed. So uh, this can be done right. Uh, this can be done well. And when it's done well, it makes the game more fun to watch and hopefully more fun to play. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. Uh, lots of, you know, there were some specifics, some uh, more generalities. There was a lot of everything here tonight. I hope our viewers could take something from it and realize that we all just want better golf. We want it to be as fair and as fair and fun as possible. And there's no way we're going to appease every single individual thrower and player out there. But the Pro Tour is clearly working toward it. And Jen, your input, along with a lot of the other women on the tour, uh, I, I think we have to kind of collectively grab everyone's uh, opinions and then make the best possible fit that's the most logical uh, in, in whatever situations we can. And we're all just trying to make disc golf better here. All right. Thank you, guys. Jen, thank you. Steve, thank you. Thank you to you, Disc. Thank you to everyone else. Uh, that's Jen, been along for the ride. <laughs> can you give me a high five? Yeah. Other uh, other side. He wants it on the side. It's the side yeah, five. No, no you. Uh, I can't see him. There you oh. go. There you go. Close. You got it. A little more. Oh. Uh, 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 there uh, we did there it. Uh, <laughs> the first ever. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a good night. We're gonna catch up with Paul Ulibar in a few minutes. We're gonna talk more women's tees with him. At, no, I'm just kidding. We're not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, no, seriously, I look forward to talking to you both more uh, as we move forward and uh, kick off this 2018 Pro Tour season in just a few weeks. Let's see way more of Jen this year after she wins a lot more this year. There it is. All right. Practice. 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 All right, guys. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So there you have it, uh, everyone. A little bit more in-depth and... Uh, it's clearly out there. Some people follow along with the specifics. Mm -hmm. Some people didn't. I hope I, that what you didn't get too hung up on all the exact specifics. And I understand people are, are that a course that you and I have played a dozen, two dozen times. We know the holes for the most part. We know the numbers. I understand it gets confusing for some people at home when you say, oh yeah, hole six when it goes. And even I have to be like, oh yeah, that's five, six. Sure. Oh yeah. Okay. There's six, that one. And, and not everybody knows that. So I understand that that can be a little frustrating for our, our, our listeners. Yeah, where the hell were you on the graphics? You should be, you, th there it is. There's our problem. I'm blaming you. So I told you, you I was going to make mistakes this year. If you got um, frustrated or bored or annoyed because Johnny V wasn't giving you graphics, I, 
Did, the did only you... way to fix that's with Super Chat. <laughs> right? Did you see the new Super Chat thing? Uh, no. Well, I did see that a couple of people contributed, so no, let's what? give some shout-outs there first and foremost, look, though. Tired uh, of crap. Thank you for the Super Chat. Uh, and did I see... Look, look at this. So look at our screen, Terry. I'm going to do a test one here. Uh, when someone does a Super Chat, look what comes up. Boom! Oh, it wow. It shows up on our thing now. Boom, boom, Was we're that something fancy. you did? We're fancy. Yeah. Oh. It, well, oh. It's, a, it's a program called Streamlabs. Um, I... I, I I put our, uh, I attached a lot of our stuff to it. Okay. Well, so, so now when people do make super chats, it's going to show up on the board. It's so in case wow, we don't. Wow, it shows up, shows up doubly. And doubly. Wes Warren for two bucks. Uh, we appreciate it. That's our super chat feature. If you, uh, <laughs> we should take high bidders uh, if we want to move to another conversation point. <laughs> there, there are actually, um, I, I, there are all these different settings in the Streamlabs program that I'm playing with that have like you can if you donate you can get a certain amount of video played or you can force here's all sorts of crazy stuff that i haven't even dug into with that but uh, uh i thought it would be kind of cool to be able to highlight some of our uh some of our super chatters i think it shows subscribers uh twitch people if anyone ever watches there i think it just like everything blows up and uh it, it's yeah so it's just little bits like this that i want to I want to be able to push the podcast forward. So, in it. yeah, we've, uh, Yuli says he's good to go. So I'm going to give him a dial up here. And we'll get Paul Yulabari on the line. And, uh, well, we won't talk too much about, uh, necessarily about the T's. Uh, that was a little joke of mine. Uh, <laughs> but we will talk to him, see what he's got going on. Yuli, of course, saw him uh, just a few days ago out at the Shelly Sharp Memorial, presented by Spinners on the Green. I think I'm going to see him in a couple more days at the Maricopa Meadows uh, event taking place this upcoming weekend. So uh, see if we can get some updates from Yuli. All right. And with that being said, welcome to the show, Paul Yulabari. How are you doing welcome tonight, buddy? Welcome back. Welcome back. Good to see you guys. Good, good to see you, good too. To see you my doing? friend. Good, good. We're doing well. Uh, I don't know if you were uh, on the sidelines or not. There was a a very lengthy but, uh, I think, informational session that went down uh, talking about this weekend's course, talking about the pro tour in general and, and women's tees, and uh, just trying to make the, the best, most competitive and exciting golf experience and uh, using some stats to do so. You're a sports fanatic. Is there is there anything that jumps out at you that we need to be looking at? As far as uh, women's tees? And, uh, not just the tees, like but the, the, the women's game. I mean, you know, you're very familiar with it um, and and how competitive it is. We, we have a few players that uh, excel, we'll say, in the distance category. But yeah. is there anything to you that you think is, uh, is going to help with our draw to the women's game? Whether it's from sponsors or from viewership or anything like that, man, I'm getting old. If they're gonna start, if they're gonna start shortening women's tees, they better start shortening our tees too. <laughs> you don't need it. Let's be let's well, be real. The here. way the PD, the way the PDG Eagle is working, and Simon, are you kidding me? Those guys are throwing it so much further than me, man. We need to we need to shorten them up. Well, just wait I'm next just... year when we have MPO 25, MPO 30, MPO 35, and you guys will all get you know, different tees. I'm making a joke about it, but but honestly, that's kind of how I feel. I, I don't think I don't think shorter tee pads is the answer. Um, I think in time, for sure, uh, you know, the rest of the women are going to catch up to uh, mm -hmm. to Paige and and Cat and you know Jennifer and Hokum and and those girls. But right now, they're elite for for a reason. You know, they throw the furthest, they make the most putts, they have more touch, and for somebody to say, okay, this isn't interesting for the rest of the world, that's kind of selfish, I feel like, um, on their part. I get I get that he's trying to make it more entertaining, but, you know, those, those girls work hard. I know they do, and I don't think that that's the right answer. I really don't. And that's, and that's why I make that joke, you know, like, <laughs> fine, shorten the tees up for us, you know. No, we hear you. Yeah, in and, a way, the same thing. You know, those those guys were blessed with that God-given talent to throw it a mile. You know, I have to figure out I have to work hard in order to compete with them in other ways um, because I don't throw as far as those guys do. And people don't throw as far as I do. 
Mm-hmm. But do I want you know to take my advantage for for what I have over the rest of the field away? Absolutely not. You know, I put in the time, and that's you know that's something that I earned and that those women earned. So, well, and I think one of the takeaways that also was discussed and whether that's discovered in the numbers or or it came straight from Jen's mouth was we find that a lot of the women aren't quite as consistent on the green as the men are. There's not as many circle two putts made and overall the actual putting averages in circle one aren't quite as uh, as consistent as, as we find. I mean, let's face it, most of our, we'll say top 10, 20, 25 players on the pro tour in the in the men's division they're making damn near it seems like every Eight. single putt inside the circle one yeah almost every cashing pro probably makes 80 percent of the putts inside the circle minimum yeah and if, and if you're not in the high 90s you're not competing at the top yeah for sure for that weekend that's just the way that it is uh and so that's one place you know, that i think women have a great opportunity to to absolutely. level to, you just said you level it, up you can find ways to make up. Maybe you don't throw as far, but I'll tell you, the first woman that makes a hundred percent of her putts inside circle one, she is going, going to, to yeah, she's going to catch up and surpass some of these other women. I mean, th- there's a reason they you say know, drive somebody, for show, putt uh, for dough. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I forgot her name right off the top top of my head, but she was competing at, at a very high level the whole entire entire year. Lisa she Fakus? just got moved up to teams. Yeah. Uh, exactly who I was thinking, and she makes a lot of putts, and she's right there. You know, it seems like every tournament. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we, exactly what you're saying. Yep, yeah, we've you seen know, her find strokes, find strokes in, in, in different ways. Own own who isn't necessarily known for her driving, although she can do that. Own Scoggins is a phenomenal putter from anywhere inside of for forty sure. feet. She she's always up competing up there in in general. <laughs> yeah. So. All right, Yuli, but, so let's get to the specifics for you this weekend. Out there at the Shelly Sharp, I mean, we call this kind of a home state, home turf. I know you're not exactly living right on the course like Ricky or Felberg or Devin Owens have in the last few years, but pretty much a ho- uh, home course uh, setting for you right there with spinners and, uh, you know, your mom, of course, present, your brother out there competing with you. Uh, how did this weekend go down for you? How did it feel? It was great, man. I mean, it is my home course. Um, for years, I, I lived very, very close to the course, and that's where I feel like, you know, I went from a pretty good pro to, you know, where I was able to compete on tour was that was that course. So I have plenty of time on it, and I do feel like that is my home course. So very familiar. We're here. Uh, you guys are playing. <laughs> the standard XL layout on the men's side in terms of the, the memorial. Uh, solid players, including Richard Thompson, who was charging hard. You opened up the tournament with the hottest score. Uh, what, what were some of the keys to success out there for you? Um, you know, I made a lot of jump putts that, that first round. It, I was lucky. I was landing at about 35 feet, it seemed like, on every hole. And I got my step putt working, and... Um, you know that kind of saved me the first round, and then and then the second round. You know Richard had that extremely hot forty-seven, which is you know that that probably would have been hot if anybody was there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he took a two-stroke lead, and uh, yeah, the final day was kind of just a back and forth battle between pretty much me and him. A little bit of Peter McBride, he showed up as well. He was in the mix for a little bit there, but. Um, yeah, uh, and I was gonna say we saw Peter McBride. Uh, obviously, one of the conversations has to be Peter McBride right there in the top, uh, battling with you guys. Uh, unlike the other two of you, you and and Richard, who we were just talking about, Peter was playing with an all new bag. Uh, did, right. Was there anything? I mean, you've played and and battled against him uh, around the country. Was there? Did you notice any difference in his game? Uh, was he at any disadvantage by having this whole new bag that maybe he's just not as familiar with? Oh, of course. He he had to have been at, at a huge disadvantage, you know, not having his go-to disc and stuff like that being the first tournament. Um, but, you know, I'm sure he's happy with the way that he played. He had a chance. He definitely had a chance going down the stretch. And uh, but, yeah, to say that, you know, he was at a disadvantage was 100 percent right. OK, it was uh, it, I, I as I walked up and caught up with you guys each of the days, it was. 
right around hole 13, 14, or 13, I think, uh, the, the three days. Uh, each time I, I – Peter and I were walking down the fairway, and I said, how are things going? You know, just kind of asking. And he's like, it's a battle. And and, uh, and he was playing solid as well. So it was, it was great to see you guys. But you couldn't tell who was winning. If you were just walking down the fairway – Everybody had their game face on. You guys were still polite and professional, of course, but everybody was zoned in and and uh, in it for that battle. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I could, you know, we couldn't ask for a better group every single round. Um, you know, Richard uh, is a good friend of mine, has been for a long time, and he has the utmost respect for everybody that he plays with. Of course, Peter's like the nicest person you'll ever meet, ever. Um, and uh, who else was on the card? Uh, the first round, I think we saw Anthony Barella, who uh, kind of Barella bounced around in the first couple of cards. Uh, her uh, during the last round was it Jeremy Her That's in right. the last round? I think right. yeah. uh, saw him yeah. up there as well. Yeah, so it was it was you know I felt like we all kind of meshed meshed well, and that allowed us to kind of get into like you said our own zones, and and you know there was really no problems as far as that went. Is there ever any additional pressure playing on your home turf? You talked about how good and familiar you are with it and what that course has done for you. But sometimes you kind of feel like, oh, man, I, I should play well here. I know this course better than anyone. Is there any of that pressure when you're out there? Oh, for sure. I mean, I pretty much tank every memorial there's <laughs> ever been ever. Well, we've seen and we've um, seen Nate Doss at, uh, at Masters Cup. He Same thing. Like, he just can't, get it done. he can't get it done. Yeah, I think there's there's something to it. Maybe uh, you know, I've all, I've particularly played well at at Vista, and then Fountain usually eats my lunch. But I never really play Fountain, you know, type thing. I'm sure if I lived there, I'd play better, you know, there. But that's a good 45 minute drive from mm -hmm. from you know 30 minute drive from Vista, so that's not really applicable for even anybody that lives in Scottsdale, really. Yeah. Uh, so, as some people have asking, just yesterday, I think we saw you made a post about uh, playing a little basketball and and warming up for your workouts. Uh, what has been your off season uh, regimen or routine? You getting swole, just pumping iron. <laughs> I'm trying to lose weight, man. I got fat <laughs> there for a little bit. Um, I did I took too. It was called 1994. And, and <laughs> I, yeah, man. I you know I took a month off, like one of the first breaks I've ever taken in disc golf ever, and you know, had some fun and, you know, ate whatever I want, drank whatever I want and had it, had a good time. And then, you know, I just got back about say three weeks ago. And since I've been back, you know, I'm definitely hitting the gym most of the time, two times a day. Um, nutrition has been a, a big thing in my off season so far, uh, besides that month, obviously, uh, you know, I'm laying off of, you know, all alcohol, all gluten, um, yeah, just trying to get into shape for the, for the season. Sounds like an eagle routine. Are you going to go straight vegan too? Can you do that? Come on. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. You're not, the, um, you're not as dedicated. Next, next time I see you, I'm going to buy you a nice big steak. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> he'll, he'll take a steak. I, I'm good with that. I'm I, in. Yeah. I, so, I love steak. So, so to, just to further that point, though, uh, about the gym. What are the things you're doing? Are you lifting weights? Are you doing cardio? Uh, any kind of uh, specific things uh, for disc golf? Or is it just kind of a general uh, health and fitness for you? No, I try to, I try to do a lot of cardio. Um, like I said, I'm actually trying to uh, lose a little, a little bit of weight while gaining a little bit of muscle. But I'm not trying to get, like, all swole or anything like that. You know, I want to... I want to stay, you know, slim, and and I, f I feel like in the past, the best disc golf that I've ever played is when I was, you know, a little bit slimmer and and lighter and a little bit faster. So, that's what I'm going going for this off season. What's your favorite cardio activity uh, out there? Well, or ma basketball. maybe machine. I, I, that's why I was just gonna say basketball is an easy one for me. Racquetball is an easy one. What's your favorite uh, machine or? Uh, uh we'll say less fun sporting uh Un activity. well unfortunately i do a lot of elliptical because of the injury that i had um in last last uh year's off season you know i had that slight tear of my mcl and so like hard running like on a treadmill or something like that is, is a little bit tougher and if i'm going to do that i'd rather you know be playing a sport or something mm-hmm 
Now, did we see a few of your uh, partners in crime, such as uh, a big germ and a few others, headed off to Thailand? Did you have any conversations with anyone before they uh, skipped the country? Yeah, I mean, they're all excited, you know, um, heading over there. Uh, they they asked me why I wasn't going a few times, and I told them, well, it's 72 degrees here, and there's a Thai food restaurant a mile down the road. So <laughs> I am in Thailand. <laughs> All right, so you're good where you need to be. With, like, you know, one-fifth yeah. of the humidity, probably. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, I'm good, man. Uh, anything out of the ordinary that we, we're going to see from you in the next month or so? Uh, you know, are you, are you playing every weekend? I think I'm going to see in a couple days, Maricopa, right? You know that you know that is one thing that I I am going to do for the first time this year is I'm not going to play every weekend. Um, I have local stuff. I have pro tours, national tours, majors, and I think I have the Nick Hyde in the schedule possibly. But other than that, I'm going to, you know, cut my tournaments almost in half, and uh, unless it's local, um, you know, spend a little more time with my family and just like. I don't think touring and playing every single weekend, you know, it, it's definitely become, becoming untrendy uh, with the top players. And I don't want to, you know, give up any advantage. I want to be I want to be fresh going into those tournaments last year, especially I felt like going into a few big tournaments. I was a little burnt out and I didn't have that fire to, you know, I was just like, oh, I hope I make a thousand bucks again this week. That'd be great. <laughs> you know, I wasn't going in there to, to win the tournament. And I feel like if I, you know, take those breaks, then I'll be fired up and, and ready to play and what ready to, you know, challenge for the win for sure. Uh, somewhere I think I have you quoted just before uh, maybe it was the Hall of Fame Classic last year. I think I have you quoted as something like, I don't care. Maybe. Did you say something like that? I don't care. <laughs> Some, at some point, I'll throw frisbees again, or I don't know, something like that. I know, I think that speaks to your exhaustion and and just the uh, the, the challenges well, was, out there on the road. Yeah, after the, after the USDGC, you know, I was gassed. Um, yeah. And then we had those two. You know, I played the um, what was it, the NT finale in and then Augusta, the and tour. I didn't have anything for the tournament. I didn't want to have anything for the tournament i wanted to be done mm -hmm. and then we had the pro tour finale and i wanted to be done i didn't have anything for that tournament and i just don't want to be that type of guy i don't want to be out there just you know going through the motions that's not who i am i want to go there you know with that fire that even if i get last place i went there and i was there to win and that's you know and gave it a hundred percent i feel like that's what i've done a lot of my career and last year i didn't have it and i don't want to have that feeling anymore well speaking of road warriors and you've been kind of the epitome of a road warrior for these last uh four or five eight years whatever it's been right now uh, you're talking about transitioning out of that mentality uh, however don't you have a uh, at least a weekend roommate that is is uh is just ramping up uh lance brown isn't is it wasn't he around this weekend and he plans to play like 78 weekends this year, doesn't he? Yeah, he's he's actually staying with me right now um, in Maricopa. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, he's new. He's fired up. <laughs> exactly. He wants to play every single weekend, <laughs> which, you know, I know the feeling. And, yeah, if you have the energy to do it, I, I say do it. You know, I love I love competing. I love competing. And that's, and that's why I have to slow down is because I – hated myself when i didn't have anything for those tournaments you know i just didn't that wasn't me i didn't want to feel that way ever again and if i ever feel like that again i'll probably quit disc golf Oof. you know for the most part like that's not what i want yeah oh well i i can understand and and like you said it's become a little bit more of a trend that uh some of our our upper echelon players realize they need to have plenty of uh, gas in the tank for the biggest events so that you're on point and ready to go and and going out and challenging for those those biggest titles and biggest paychecks that all makes perfect sense yeah absolutely and, and there's there's all kinds of things that go with that you know like i i haven't you know seen my nieces and nephews really grow up i'm gone all the time um you know and there's little things like that you know i'm 30 years old you know, I needed I need to take time for my family and, and things like that now, and um, that doesn't include forty eight tournaments a year. 
Uh, speaking of family, I opened the show by saying uh, Boyd and the rest of the crew and Keith and so many people and Chris Cobb, uh, a, a, just an amazing set of people out there in Arizona. I, I feel like now that I've been there four or five times in the last few months, I, I feel like it's a second home, I wish. Uh, but family, I also uh, shared a beverage. I think your, your mom was uh, graciously <laughs> trying to remember how she worded that. I think she said, I'm buying your next one. We need to talk more, uh, is how I think she said it on Saturday night. Yeah. And uh, I got to say, it was one of the first times her and I, I feel like we really had a, a dialogue that was about so much more than just like, hey, what's going on this weekend? And so-and-so is winning or shooting well. And, and it, was, it was a couple hours long, and it was an, an amazing conversation. Your mom is obviously your biggest fan and biggest supporter out there we see her at so many tournaments uh, that's got to be great to have her not just in your corner mentally but physically on any given weekend at, especially at the biggest events there's your mom what, what does that mean for you yeah oh, it's you know it's incredible that to have that that support and you know there's no way that i would be able to even describe the feeling when you know when i'm there and i'm struggling and i can see my mom there and, you know, it, it makes me want to go harder and push harder because, um, you know, I don't want to let my family down. I don't want to let my mom down who came all that way to see me. So it, it helps. It helps for sure. And it, and, and it would help anybody. You know, that's just what family does. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I'm truly lucky to have that support system that I do here in Arizona. Um, and I definitely hope I never take that for granted because it, it, it truly is like, it's inspirational really when I'm playing. It is. And, uh, I, I think others would say, okay, some people want a caddy to travel with them. Uh, some people would be saying, no, I, I, I want Yuli's mom. I want her on my side <laughs> hanging out with me for the weekend. Uh, she knows golf. She knows the players. Uh, so that's why it's, uh, again, just another facet. It's so great to have these conversations with her, uh, because she, she sees things. And, and as a mother, you know, she shared things with me as she's watching both you and your brother play. Uh, it's been quite an experience for her, and she she spoke of your competitive nature and some of your upbringing a little bit when we were when we were talking. And um, she she's as you know, she's fully vested in what's going on with you guys out there. It's it's awesome to see. Yeah, it's, it, it's awesome, and she actually just recently started playing too. She probably plays more than me. She plays <laughs> almost every day. You know, and and it's a great um, it's a great thing for her her to do. And you know, we I grew up in a small town, so there's not a lot lot to do. And she gets to get out and play every day. And I know she's she's lost a little weight, and she looks great. And I've I've really never seen her more happy. So, uh, you know, disc golf, you know, is big part of my my life, and now it's becoming a really big part of just my family's life in general. So, pretty soon, a new touring partner. Yeah, moms. <laughs> it's like taking your mom to the prom, right? You just you're like, hey, come on, ma, let's uh, let's get in the car and go for a trip. That would be Seriously. perfect. I, it's it's nice to know, especially in Arizona, that she's always going to be there, mm -hmm. no matter what. She's going to be at the tournament. You know, she's going to be there this weekend in Maricopa. And when I'm gone, you know, she's constantly posting about me, and my brother's playing here in Arizona, and she follows him every single tournament. You know, she'll. She'll go out when he's playing and, and go back and forth between the cards, and sometimes we're lucky enough to play together too. So, now this weekend you got the best of them. I, there was a lot of chatter. Uh, I thought it was was it just last year that he was uh, he was contending in this event. Does that sound about right? I mean, he was playing, but uh, I think he had a uh, one of the, one of the hotter rounds uh, in that event last year. But this weekend you had his number or or a bunch of numbers. Yeah, my no, my brother's a very talent, just a talented individual. Period. Mm -hmm. You know, I've I've probably played twice as long as him, and he's you know he's gonna be a thousand rated maybe next update. Um, his you know he's just incredible. I I, I don't like when he beats me, of course. <laughs> um, which he has uh, very recently beat me a bunch, <laughs> and I just I just not gonna let that happen anymore. But. Well, get back in the gym. All when right? he does, if there was somebody to beat me, I I would lo love for it to be my brother. And when we play together, it's awful because 
I find myself rooting for him, you know, <laughs> and then I'm kind of getting out of my game. I'm like, come on, man, you know, like, what are you doing? Like, make that putt or, or something like that. I, you know, I really, really find myself rooting for him. Well, uh, lots of love going on there. Uh, and speaking of love, we see another Arizona native. Uh, I, I, I had a chance to catch up, catch up with Trina, as uh, who's Anthony Barella's mom, and uh, Anthony you Barella. Hang out with all the moms. It was it like some sort of like mom dinner, and you were invited. Uh, it was a good weekend. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, in, in talking with her, she was talking about AB, and uh, you know he's he's moving closer to graduation uh, this mm-hmm. this year, and it, it's going to be exciting to see him. Uh, sounds like he's going to have a little bit of room to go out and uh, spread his wings, so to speak, uh, cut his teeth on the tour a little bit, and uh, that's another serious contender coming out of Arizona every single weekend. He throws far, he putts well, uh, keeping up with one of those young guns. No, absolutely. I mean, that kid's so talented. It's ridiculous. Um, he, uh, yeah, he graduates soon. Um, hopefully he's going to be getting out a little more, you know, I, uh, I'll be seeing him. I believe he's playing Utah open Beaver state fling, and he's probably going to be traveling with me to a couple of those events. So he'll be, he'll be, uh, definitely forced to be reckoned with really, really soon. What, uh, what would be, what will be some of the conversations or words of advice or, or, or do they, do they go unspoken uh, when you might be traveling together? Take for instance, a long ride up to Utah and you guys have, we'll just say, I don't know, 12 hours in the car to get there. Uh, will, will there be talks of life or will there be talks of golf strategies? I have no clue. I haven't spent a lot of personal time with Anthony. You know, the, the time that we've spent together so far is just talking trash to each other, really. <laughs> okay. And so uh, it'll be it'll definitely be interesting. Um, probably talk about how I just beat him down on the basketball court <laughs> right ah. after the tournament. Well, he's like a foot taller than you now, isn't he? At least. Yeah, and at least a step slower. <laughs> oh! <laughs> yeah, well, when you're – when when – when he makes a move and both your knees give out because you're seriously, you know. hey, I'm not that old. Yet, man. Come on. Okay, one knee. One knee gives out. Yeah. Uh, uh, P- Pete's out on the board. He says Anthony or AB will sleep the whole way, and uh, Cupcakes out on the board. He says hello. So, uh, but yeah. and as Chris Cobb, you know, uh, uh, echoes what you say. Uh, a little bit of trash talking back and forth. Uh, he he throws it far, and when his putt is on, he's scary good. And uh, he's, yeah, I'm looking forward to it this he's weekend. A, he's a great kid too, man. He's super respectful to his elders. You know, as he has great parents, he has a great support system here in Arizona. There, you know, the sky's the limit for him for sure. It uh, it was we're coming up on that one year of uh, last year at the Maricopa event. Is uh, I was I was honored to be there. That was the first time he had accepted cash. Sapu Payu ended up winning the event. He was in town, uh, but Anthony accepted cash for the first time ever, becoming officially a pro. And that's a moment I'll never forget because I know he's going to go on to continue to do great things in his pro career. And uh, something like that is something I'll always remember as a as a video yeah. guy and as a reporter. Like, yeah, I was there when when he uh, performed the way he did and took it down. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, it, it dare I ask any. It's two rounds of 27 this weekend. It's going to be slow rounds, I think, when they're two rounds of 27, five sums on every hole. It's jam-packed in Maricopa, uh, 10 o'clock shotgun start for everybody. Uh, what, what's the game plan? I can't stand that place. <laughs> <laughs> I've never played good there one time ever. And, um, you know, it was like it, there was a second where I – I almost didn't play, but everybody in this house is playing. So I'm like, you know, I don't want to be here twiddling my thumbs while <laughs> my boys are out there playing. All right. So you're um, committed. Uh huh. I don't know, man. There's, there's, it's a bunch of like tweener holes for me, like just bad distances. And I just have never, I've just never played there and played there well. So until this I'm weekend. Going to, yeah. So I'm like super excited <laughs> about it. <laughs> Well, you no, know, if I'm you gonna... drop out, Ricky Waisaki, I think, is just chomping at the bit to possibly get into that event. 
So I, I don't know. I don't. You you want to hand it Is over it, to Rick? You can have my spot. I'll split. <laughs> I'll split the cash with him. That's spot. awfully nice of you. <laughs> that's so generous of you. No, and that's not. I'm not trashing the tournament in any way. Like the course is awesome. It's immaculate. You've been there. Mm-hmm. Um, Hav and and the whole crew they do an amazing job for the tournament. I just can't throw the shots there. I don't know what it mm. is. I just I forget how to putt. My discs are rolling out of bounds. I'm throwing all my best discs straight in the water. It's terrible. <laughs> Wait a minute. You're finding. Oh, okay. Yeah. There's. A... I was gonna say. Where are you finding? Yeah. The first couple of. Uh, I find is... it. I find it, Terry. I <laughs> That's swear. true. I think you had a really bad. Was that last year? You had a really bad roll away on on like hole six, and it might have been two or three like roll aways. <laughs> <laughs> all right we I don't need to play there the other day uh they had like a doubles event and i ran like a clinic and i'm like sweet yeah we'll play the doubles and i i threw like two in the water and like we were like last place it was terrible all right well it'll all change this weekend and it'll be on yeah. film and so if it doesn't change it'll Perfect. be on film <laughs> <laughs> all right yuli anything else you need to share with us lots of well, arizona love oh, yeah lots okay. of arizona love i was gonna say you're part of the new what used to be called DGI. Now they've kind of updated the name, so it's just the DG Group, I believe, mm-hmm. Disc Golf Group. Mm-hmm. Uh, what what kind of insights can you give us on that from your perspective? We talked to the other Paul a few the weeks ago Paul. about it, but but uh, being someone who is, we'll say, someone who doesn't have the championships that the other Paul has, what what is your what is your take on all that? Pro World Championships. I mean, he's got <laughs> Am World. That's true. You've got a different championship than him. Yeah, he he can never win what I want. Yeah. I still have chances at <laughs> right. pro, pro worlds. <laughs> right. Hold that over him. All right. So, what does it mean yeah. for you? <laughs> um, it's awesome, man. You know, it's a, uh, you know, I've spoken with both uh both of Sam and and Mark, and I really I really believe in what they're doing. Um, I think that. Uh, you know, they have a good chance and a good platform to, to, you know, push the sport in the right direction. And that's exactly why I signed with them. Um, like you said, the cool thing about, about it is, you know, Macbeth has his stuff, Ricky has his stuff and I'm separate, you know, they, they represent me separately from them. So they do what they can do for Paul Uliberry. And that's what, you know, that's why, you know, I kind of bought in, into the system is I don't want to be, you know, Paul McBeth, Ricky, I want to be Paul Uliberry and I want them to represent me for what I can bring to the table and what they can get from me because it, it is 100% different, um, than those other guys. You know, I bring other aspects to different companies that those guys wouldn't bring, you know, so all those sponsors like Ben Gay, Ace Medical Wraps, all those things are great for, you know, a guy of your age, right? <laughs> Uh, no, and, and we, we know that you're incredibly wow. competitive. Earlier, uh, I think it was Dad's drunk, uh, who's um, off, uh, off. <laughs> what's the word, <laughs> out of detention here. What are you here. guys talking about <laughs> no. right now? Uh, Don't worry about it. What I was trying to get at, though, is you're very competitive. Uh, you, you enjoy not only watching but participating in sports. So it's great that uh, as you look out to the sponsors, like you said, you may have a totally different perspective or an angle that one of your fellow uh, represented players might have. And, and oh, is, is there sure. a company or a handful of companies off the top of your head you'd love to share that if they're listening, which I'm sure they are, you know, a Nike or a Gatorade, is there, is there a company in. in particular that you would really love to, to have an opportunity with? Yeah, I mean, you know, growing up in skateboarding and stuff, you know, I've been really uh, involved with, you know, Monster and, and Red Bull and things like that. I think an energy drink, you know, I could definitely get on board with with something like that. Um, my brother was a professional BMXer, so I was kind of around that type of atmosphere, you know, half my life. And I feel like, uh, you know, that would be a perfect fit for, for disc golf, really. And so there's stuff like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I you know the way that I've I've carried myself through my career allows me to have those di- those those things where I'm I feel like I'm very marketable and I bring a lot I can bring a lot to the table for any of those companies. So I'm excited and I'm I'm really optimistic with everything that's going on 
right now in disc golf, and I'm just really happy to be a part of it, really. I'm excited to hear more about, and I, I don't expect the details, but I am excited to hear more about that first phone call, and maybe that first phone call goes to everyone. Uh, I keep calling you guys a team. I know you're not a team. Everyone within the group, or maybe it just goes to you, or maybe it just goes to uh, Paige or Kat or whomever. I'm excited sure. to hear what that first deal is going to be for yeah, any of too. you. Uh, oh, we're I, all excited. Yeah. yeah, yeah that, any Anything that they bring in, w when they bring it in, is going to be, it's going to be great for disc golf. And, um, yeah, you know, the sky's the limit for the future of disc golf. So I think we all know that. But, I mean, secretly or not so secretly, you, you want a better deal than whatever Big Germ gets offered, right? A better deal than Big Germ? Yeah, uh, in any. <laughs> you... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to get a better deal. <laughs> I don't know. Some people apparently like his uh, his side of commentary uh, out there. What, what well, do you, you think? get sponsored by like a microphone or something? <laughs> there, there great. you go. So, you know, some people have the looks. Some people have you know the speaking ability. Yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> Uh, someone else brought it up on the board, and we know you're a big fan of the footballs. Ooh. All right, bye, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not even going to talk about your Steelers. I, I, we're, we're talking Super Bowl here. All right. I believe the Eagles are, someone said, a five-point underdog. What is your take on the Super Bowl? Who is going – is Brady going to pull out – he's going to have to get a sixth ring, or are we going to see the Eagles finally – win one in like 30 some years you know it's it's a tough question to ask me I, I haven't followed the eagles the whole entire season because i didn't think they were for real i really didn't i thought that they were going to get crunched and then when wentz went down i especially thought that they were done mm -hmm. and they just keep doing it and they looked really great against a really a really good vikings team and so you know the patriots man it seems like they just get handed this stuff on a silver platter every year. I mean, I've said it before. Buffalo. I don't, I don't think the a, the AFC get, is not nearly the division or the conference. We'll say that the NFC is. There's way more parity in the NFC than there is in the AFC. It seems like there's like two teams in the AFC, and it's your Pittsburgh and the and the Pats, and those are the two that seem to fight back and forth. And the NFC, we're seeing, I think we see a lot more parity. And whether that's as good as the AFC or not, uh, that's debatable. But Like Tennessee and Buffalo, like, come on. And then, you know, Buffalo, Buffalo and the Jags, they put up like a combined 20 points or something terrible. And then they go and put up 45 against Pittsburgh, like the greatest game ever. And then they get, they just look like a, you knew that they were going to lose. Mm -hmm. In that in that Patriot game, you just knew the whole entire time. Even when they were winning, you felt like they were behind, and that's what you know. That's what the Patriots do. They just they are so good at the little things that yeah. it makes it just makes everybody else look worse. Even yeah. though if you look at like their their O line and it's not that good. No, you're right. It's I, just I, that like... they, it's just that they do everything so good. They're so well coached, and Tom Brady doesn't make any mistakes. He's very smart. And so it's just it's impossible to to go against the Patriots right now. It I, just is. I, I think they're gonna win. I don't know. I think it might be down to a field goal or something just yeah. because it's the Super Bowl and I don't see somebody really running away with it. Um, because the Eagles are good and they're athletic. But I feel like Bill Belichick He'll deflate a couple footballs and like you know, steal some signs, a couple refs, and yep. hey, slick some hands. Did you see that meme where like the first person to congratulate Brady was a ref? The he, ref, like, yeah. On the back, like, hey, uh, congrats! <laughs> glad glad we, could, we could do it. Yeah, glad we could help you out. I'll see you at the Super Bowl. <laughs> right, it's just, it's uh, just I, hilarious. I totally, but. yeah. Um, here, the 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 Pats have a history of keeping the Super Bowl close. I think almost every one of their games has been within like they six points. It close. Yeah, it's been like three or six points. I, I think the only way the Eagles win is if they get in Brady's face, if they can dominate that O-line. Otherwise, Brady will pick them apart. Because as much as you know, Dad's drunk and I joke back and forth, Brady is the best quarterback we've probably ever seen in the game. 
Yeah, you, for sure. He, he might not. He might not have the best. I, I've said before. He might not have the best skills of any quarterback. You know, I, I'll lean on my guy Aaron Rodgers to be a better passer, a better defensive for reader. Sure. But, but Brady and that team is they're they're you know Brady and Belichick. They're the best. You know, they they play yeah, so well it's together. That combo. But I'm yeah, rooting. I'm rooting combo. for the Eagles. I think the Eagles are going to cover the spread, and I'm I'm actually I actually think the Eagles are going to win. I'm going to go. I'm going to go on a little limb. I think the Eagles are going to win. Wow. I think, I think you're wrong. Uh, it's, yeah, Yuli, it's tough to go with the Eagles because they... The, the problem is the Eagles position. play like garbage away from Wentz, home field. Then yes, I would say if Wentz was going to take them down and it would, it would be, you know, I would feel like they were the better team. But right now I just, with Bill Belichick and Tom Brady, I just, I don't see it happening. Uh, and I'll say this, the problem, the only thing that worries me is, like I said, the Eagles play like garbage away from home. So... Yeah. Go, going to Minnesota again is going to be. Uh, we'll 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 see, we'll see. I All honest, right. I honestly I felt like Pittsburgh was the only team that could take the Patriots down because they'd be able to, like mm-hmm. you said, when when the game's close, like the Pats are gonna win. Yeah. They just For they sure. just get the job done. For sure. And I felt like Pittsburgh was, you know, that offense could totally like run away with the game, and obviously they're not getting a chance, but that was. It's it's the Patriots. They're gonna they're gonna win again. Yeah, I hope not. I hope but. not too. But well, so the final football related question of the night then would be: Will you place any friendly or <laughs> not so friendly. not so friendly wagers on uh, on any Super Bowl situation? Spreads, outright winner, any whatever i mean no. and you just said who you think i'm will gonna win. stay away from that game because okay. i know like like we said I, I think it's going to be a one score game at the end of the end of the game and it you know it's a coin toss really at okay. that point all right well good all right if somebody wants to bet with me and and take eagles straight up then i i might consider <laughs> taking the patriots because that would be a traitor. silly bet on their part traitor <laughs> Look at you, you right. traitor. <laughs> Chris Young up in uh, Smuggler's Notch territory says, PM me for any bets. So We got great. We have a, we have a Smashbox bookie now. Yeah. So <laughs> this is what we need. <laughs> All right. Terry, what time, are you, uh, what time are you flying in? Uh, what time are you picking me up? No, I, uh, I, I'm coming in about 9 o'clock Friday night. <laughs> uh, I'm, coming in, <laughs> I'm coming in about 9 o'clock Friday night. Yeah, I think it's 9 o'clock. Uh, and this is going to be a pretty, you know, quick in and out for me. I'm going to get in on Friday night. Uh, I'll be uh, staying with Hav uh, once I get down to Maricopa. Uh, filming Saturday, filming Sunday, and then hopping back on a plane, it looks like, on Sunday night. And I'll be back out of town so I can uh, get home to start editing this one right away. So but uh, so I won't see you much other than right on the course, but looking forward to it. Awesome. All right. Safe travels and uh, good talking with you, Johnny. You too, um, thanks man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, we'll keep you on um, again later this year. Like I said, the Smash or the Smashbox, the Skip A site's getting all redesigned. I should know more again tomorrow. We'll get Yuli's okay. picks going again. I'm excited for that. So perfect. I can't wait, guys. Yeah. This year's going to be awesome. I agree. All right, pal. Well, again, congrats on the win this weekend and a nice thousand plus uh, paycheck. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you in a couple days back down in uh, beautiful Arizona. Keep Terry away from your mom. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> no comment. Out. <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> Have a good yeah, day, buddy. Yuli. <laughs> All right. Of course, Paul Ulibarri joining us. He's your champion this weekend. Colleen Thompson on the women's side uh, ultimately bested Jennifer Allen. Jennifer, I think, had the lead after round one, then uh, carried a lead after round two, but then ultimately was bested are, by. Uh, are Richard and Colleen related or married or in any sort of way? I don't know. Nope. Okay. <laughs> nope. Uh, Colleen Thompson, originally out of Illinois. I think she's your yeah. Amworlds champ in 2010 or 2011, if you yeah. clicked on her. Uh, somewhere around that time frame uh, as an Amworlds champion. Uh, Richard, old school player, uh, who's still a young gun, but an old school player. Who I met many, many years ago, a uh, powerful lefty. Uh, kind of the side, quick side story was that he, from what I gathered, all but took off most of 2017 from playing golf. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there was an injury or life or whatever, but from what I gathered, all but wasn't around for 2017. Shows up, and if you click on it, average probably 1050, 1060 ish golf for the weekend. 
Richard? Uh, Richard played. Oh yeah, he he he, he faltered in that oh, last yeah, round that with last a nine ninety nine, but dropping Sorry. a ten fifty eight, a ten eighty four, and a nine ninety nine. <laughs> yeah, oh, uh, that's still about ten ten forty ish golf. Yeah, that that ain't bad. That's nothing to sneeze at. <laughs> and Chris uh, Chris Kesselhoff, who we referenced a little earlier, your next gen winner from last year, uh, ultimately coming in at third place, just getting Peter McBride by a stick. So that was your top four players with. Uh, Drew Gibson and Anthony Barella coming up just uh, past them. As you said, Colleen Thompson winning in FPO, followed up by Jen Allen, uh, and then looks like Azrael Rogers DNF. But let's not bury the lead of the most important division at that event. The, the, there weren't any juniors. The Pro we're Masters 40-plus taking down the field. What? Not you. Uh, no. Brian Rogers. Yes. You, hold on. Scroll, scroll. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, there were eight players. You tied for fifth. I did with Bob Kolchak. You played amazing you, guy. Yep. And I played the final round. You played all three with rounds him on with him, his didn't birthday. You? I did play all three rounds, but the final round was on his birthday. So I mean, uh, Bob, thanks, buddy. It was fun. Throwing a 904, an 895. Wow. And a 940. I was lobbying for shorter tees, damn it. All right. I was right there arguing with, with Jen, Jen, saying, No, uh, you're wrong, Jen. I, I need a shorter tee. I, yeah, that's rough. That, that, that's not the Terry Miller I know. I it know you, was you're out not. of whack. It's been, it's been a while. But even that, to me, I was watching and I was cringing. I was like, Ah, oh, Miller. You were every time I watched you. Every time I watched you were having a good round. Then suddenly, like it went mm. like, "There's a bogey." I'm like, "Okay." Then you followed it up with five more bogeys. It was like the back nine just decided to kick you in the head every. Yeah, the back or the middle, exactly. And I, I, it's funny that I, I, I feel like I can chime in, and I'm not going to rehash all of the uh, women's tees conversation. But as a guy uh, now whose skills have clearly dim diminished. I, th I, I was going to try and count. I think I played like nine rounds of disc golf in 2017. Ooh, that's like so as a guy whose skills have me. clearly diminished, those a lot of those holes were, were out we're, at Vista. Yeah. A lot of those holes, if you're not throwing pinpoint accurate, 350, 360, 375. If you're not throwing pinpoint accurate to 375, mm -hmm. there's very, very, very little opportunity for birdie. Correct. And and so dare I say, I could insert my skill sets into the women's conversation. Really easily. And a lot of it truly is applicable to me. At, yep. Again, at, heck, if I'm rated 958 according to that, which again is not even, for long. even outdated exactly <laughs> and is about to uh, dip. But I could, I, I, my skill sets and my distance and then my, probably my putting accuracy, all very similar to some of our upper echelon women's players. Obviously, I'm not on the level of, of Paige or Cat, but of most of the other women that are in that, uh, that second tier, we'll say, uh, ratings wise. And I, there, I can't tell you how many holes. And this is exactly what Sarah Holcomb says. She says it is boring. Not just not just boring. She it is boring. It's boring, um, uninspiring. Not it doesn't feel like playing the game of golf when on hole two, three, four, for instance, five, even whatever. They're all in that three forty five to three ninety range, mm -hmm. and I drive it to maybe circle two, maybe I'm pin high, maybe I'm left, maybe I'm right. And then I have a 45 footer, which uh, percentages are pretty low. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Pretty low huh. on those percentages. Uh, and so I can't tell you how many times I walked up to a hole. I was like, oh, I'm 67 feet out. I just threw it under the basket because I'm like, I'm not going to risk two putting with how rusty I am. But it was just, it was a layup. I can't tell you how many times I walked up bag on shoulder without even a thought and say, oh, throwing it underneath the basket. Okay. And well, I mean, it, I could see how that could that 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 wasn't fun golf for me. And I'm not complaining by any means. I'm just saying that's that was my mentality. That type of golf. That type of golf really for me got uh, got kind of old. Um, okay. And that that's because I, I'm clearly not. I wasn't playing well. I'm not blaming anyone or anything. It's just. Uh, and then and you're, then there was very yeah. few opportunity to make up strokes. That was the that was the then kicker True. is because. You know, you think about some of these holes that are 750 or, or, or 700 feet. 
Again, that's a pinpoint accurate 350, a pinpoint accurate 350, and then hopefully making a putt some, somewhere inside the circle. I wasn't doing that, and therefore, uh, at best, I was playing for a par. And it's kind of funny. I only had a handful of birdies the entire weekend out there, mm-hmm. and they happened to be on all the shortest holes. But my, my my favorite thing of this weekend was going to the live scoring and having <laughs> only only your card. <laughs> like people people are like, "Ooh, live scoring!" And yeah. then it's like, "Oh, what? Why is like the second card of Pro Masters the only live scoring card?" <laughs> it's because you set it up. I, I laughed. I laughed so hard every time I would look at that. I'm like, all right, uh, go, Miller. To follow that up, uh, Max Nichols was out there. Uh, he was competing all weekend, finished around, I don't know, 12th or so. He said uh, on the first night, he's like, oh, they've, they had live scoring. I'll go out and see you know, how everyone really shot. And he said he clicked on the link for live scoring. He's like, all I saw was your card. <laughs> and he's like, I was so disappointed. I'm like, you should have been. Um, and the only uh, reason that got set up is because uh, I know how the back end of the system works. And then I took it upon myself uh, to work with Keith to then input the scores as we were yeah. going along. Um, so I'm sorry for everyone out there that was uh, so disappointed that all you got were, were I, I wasn't. Scores. I laughed every time I brought it up, and I I'd, I'd hit that down arrow to look for other divisions, and there are none No there. other card, not even the lead card. No, no, I know. That's what made me laugh. It was just your card. Oh, God. Um, yeah, so... Right. Uh, it, did, did you throw any new plastic? Did you did really, you try anything out, or I, did you, you know, just kind of stick to... I feel bad. I brought along an Emac Truth, which I can't say that I've really uh, thrown too much. Uh, by the time it was, you know, it was Friday morning, and I had to tee, mm. I didn't go out and want to try a whole bunch of new plastic. I, I already know how not good I am with my existing plastic. And uh, so I didn't really give the Emac Truth a real chance. Uh, Lance Brown generously gave me a... a, a D1 later that he said I could go out and try, cool. which is probably too much disc for me. Um, but So I didn't really get a chance. I will say uh, <laughs> the one disc I, I just kind of randomly pulled out of storage. I was like, ah, I'll throw this in my bag. I, I think I kind of remember throwing it. Was a Proto Star Star Mako, which I don't know how many years ago that was released. All I know, I'll admit, every time I threw it, it went damn near exactly where I wanted. Oh. Um Okay, I, I call that a plug. I don't know, but that's it was your, uh, that's your Terry Miller in the bag. <laughs> yes, no. Uh, but again, thank you to Chris Cobb uh, for caddying uh, during the half of the second round and all of the third round. He he helped keep my spirits up. As uh, you, here's one thing I'll say quickly before I move on, and it's not. Um, I also, for the first time in my life, played with a brace of sorts. It was a a, a wrap. One of those wraps uh, that. I, it was single. around my forearm near my elbow. A- elbow issues? Yeah, I've had elbow issues the few times I have played, uh, including last October and then when I played one casual round a few weeks ago. And my elbow is killing me, and I have no idea what to do. So I just went and bought one of those brace things for 10 bucks. I, it wrapped around, and it applied a little pressure right near my elbow. And at no point did I really feel any pain whatsoever like I have in the past That's in good. playing. But I also feel like it cut off a little bit of the the circulation and or touch or finesse I had with my putter. That's not good. Which was not good at all. Um, yeah, it just wasn't good. So I don't know if there's a happy medium. I'm going to have to reach out to Seth over at Disc Golf Strong. Maybe he's got an idea, but it helped One with the driving. Push-ups. It helped with the driving. It did not help with the putting at all. I, I just, I felt like my putt, well, I didn't, I can't say I didn't know where it was going to go, but it was... F- I missed everything wide right, and my arm did not feel the same as I'm, I'm making a motion right now. It just, uh, someone it is saying those tending compression straps undo it for putts. Like, oh, it that would have been smart. Oh, yeah, probably. Like 54 holes ago. That would have been really <laughs> smart. <laughs> All right, let's wrap this up. We'll, we get, we'll get into some after show um, where we'll talk about even less exciting things than Terry's golf game. What? Uh, we're also going to talk about the Marksman League. Uh, oh which, yeah, uh, Dude, you, know, you so want to do that busy. right then? Let's. Uh, you want to do it now or then? We we can do it now. Yeah, let's do it. We got the Marksman League uh, presented by Dynamic Disc. I think we're going to also have a giveaway uh, with relation to that. I was talking to Bobby Brown briefly, uh, and uh, a few of the cool notes that we had, uh, I guess, come across. Again, you can check it out at dynamicdisc.com/wml, as in winter 
Marksman League. What was that? WML. DynamicDiscs.com slash WML. Perfect. Or should I be like everyone else and say backslash when it's not? It's a forward it's, slash? It's a forward I slash. Know. Don't. Um, we'll give you the update on the standings here in just a moment. Yep. Also, they've hit a milestone that there are over 100 leagues taking place. Wow. And that people have until February 16th to register and start a league. And then that's where you can do it is out at, again, at uh, dynamicdisc.com slash WML. And, of course, always check out uh, UDISC. Uh, you can find the stats out there. I know we talked about that a little bit yep. last UDISC. week. UDISC.com slash Marksman. Exactly. So you can check those out. Uh, wh- have we seen any crazy changes, any standings? More putts were made, apparently. More, we're up to 44% accuracy. More putts. Uh, still leading the top region is Kansas. So uh, we have out of Newton, we got Swede and Troy, uh, both playing well. They're at, uh, Kansas is at 767, followed up by Michigan, which is at 757. Um, the funny thing about Kansas is I don't see Emacs name up there this week. So what? this is the top five putters. Granted, this, like I said, this top five putters in the last seven days. So maybe Emac didn't play or something along those lines. Emac, uh, what happened? At the global leaderboard right now out of Oregon, Rick Safiels with 161. Troy out of Cheyenne, Wyoming at 159. Tied with him is... Swede out of Newton, Kansas with a 159. And Troy is in fourth place as well. How do you you play two? Oh, I suppose you can play multiple leagues. Or there's one in Wyoming and there's one in Kansas. And they're two different. Oh, they're two Troys. different Troys. I'm sorry. I was like, there's there's Troy out of Cheyenne, Swede out of Newton, and Troy out of Newton. So I just looked at it. You're right. So Troy, I was like, I wonder what if you he's talking about mistakes earlier. Oh yeah. I was I thought maybe there was two Troys. I thought maybe there was there's two leagues. There's more than one Troy in this world. I don't buy that. Yes, I do yes. not buy that. I heard. Yeah, so Troy out of Newton, Kansas, uh, with one fifty eight. So that's the that's your global leaderboard for this week. Um we can look at some marksman accuracy. In the on um, stations four and five, those are your smaller marksman baskets. One through three are played on, we'll say, uh, competition size baskets. Four and five are played on the marksman skinnier baskets that will help improve your putting game. So you have Rick Safiels at seventy three percent accuracy, tied with Troy from Cheyenne, not the other Troy, uh, at seventy three percent, along with Marks from Wisconsin Rapid at seventy three percent. So. Uh, Fourth place is Das Nuke. I hope he's not putting with a nuke. Um, if he is, it'd at 70%. All, maybe it'd be even better if, if he was. At, at 70%, <laughs> if he's putting with a nuke, I can't really question him. So no. congr- congratulations on that. And finally, your global overall standings. Uh, Emac only had a 155 this week, it looks like. Ugh, come on, step it up, brother. Uh, Emac still in first place at 684 points. Uh, Leah Vaspen out of Norway, 636, and Dixon Jowers out of Emporia at 630. Emac's got himself a healthy lead, so what I'd like to see everyone do is um, try to catch Emac. Let's beat him. He can't win the Marksman League. It would not be... Somebody would claim it was rigged. It, I'm, I'm sure. I bet you his Marksman basket's a little bigger. Yeah, probably. <laughs> He brings his he, guys. I'm gonna set up my own just, basket. Just no, 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 no. I get to use this one. You guys <laughs> use the other ones. I'm just gonna slide this one in here. These are my special so, putters. Yeah. So anyway, go ahead, check that out. Udisc.com/slash marksman. We will uh, we'll work on doing some stuff, fun stuff with them, and kind of keeping you guys up to date on this. If you have a marksman league in your area, please go out and find it. It's a great way to spend your off season. I really, honestly wish we had one here in the area. If we did, I would be out there every week. And I just don't have the gumption personally to get out and find a place to to do it. So I'm yeah. really I'm really hoping that if they do this next year, that I'm I'm able to to kind of rein that in. And I'd love to maybe even head that up or help somebody do that myself. All right, guys. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna stand down for a moment or two. We're gonna move into the after show. We're gonna have our Patreon only giveaway, and then we're also uh, gonna tie that. Well, not tie that together. We're gonna have a separate giveaway uh, from Dynamic Disc and the Marksman League as our sponsor for it. Uh, so we'll be having two giveaways in the after show. We're gonna tease it out. You gotta stick around all night. Uh, you will have to be present, so to speak, virtually present anyway. 
uh, for the Marksman League giveaway. Our Patreon supporter, if you're not listening uh, live on the show, that's fine. But the Marksman League giveaway uh, must be somebody that's going to be listening in and probably have to answer or comment or on the something. YouTube chat. On I the think, YouTube chat. I think the problem was someone had mentioned that someone had beat them on the our earlier question with uh, Felberg, and maybe it was on the Facebook chat. But we we pay attention to Facebook, but just minimally. The yeah. official. Face, I'm sorry, the official Smashbox chat is the YouTube chat, so please use that one. Yes, that is where all questions and answers live and die, officially, or something. True. All right, so we're going to close it out for now. Uh, super great conversation that took place with Steve and Jen. If you didn't follow it all, go re-listen to it because there was a lot of great points, uh, lots of views, and uh, I think we're all going to – we're going to get it figured out one way or another. We're all in our growing stages, growing pains, whatever it might be. TDs are learning. The pro tour is learning. Uh, the, the women are, are giving great uh, candid feedback. And uh, I think it's just a matter of getting it all dialed in. And, and we'll get uh, there. We'll get there. I know that much. I also like to thank, of course, our next gen uh, super tour director, super super tour director in uh, Dave Felberg, 2008 world champion. We appreciate Dave giving us some insights uh, on the next gen. Also like to thank Paul Ulibarri for joining us, giving us some uh, recap, a little bit of what we saw at the Shelly Sharp, and I'm looking forward to seeing him in Maricopa. So for Johnny V and myself, Terry Miller, the disc golf guy, it's been great uh, yapping with you guys. Yeah, I think that's what we were doing. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's been fun. We're looking forward to seeing you guys in the after show. We'll see you next time when you step inside the Smashbox. Thank you to our $2 and above patrons. Your name is listed below in the credits. If you are interested in being listed as a producer in the Smashbox TV credits and supporting this and other fine podcasts, please visit patreon.com slash Smashbox TV. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Podcast 179's After Show. Those of you that were watching on the broadcast, you noticed that for some reason the, the $2 and above patrons locked up the video. I updated that today with because, as I said, this week we got a lot of new patrons. I was very, I was very happy and extremely thankful, and I exported a new video, so I wonder if that video had some sort of fault to it because it did... It just kind of locked up on us. And then no, with this new Streamlabs thing, it can I can also run a separate credit for people that do uh super chat. Super chat. So you will so what? Super, super chat credits as well. So as long as I remember, we'll do super chat credits at the end of the regular credits for anyone what? that gives on that. So I will uh it just didn't feel the same closing out the show, not hearing that godlike authoritative voice oh, coming the, down from you thank you to our the, the voice was there oh. just the str- just the oh. video part locked up you took away and ran away for a second oh yeah i, I missed that part you did 
<laughs> I think it's only fair that in that same voice and tone, you read every single $2 patron right now. Yeesh. Uh, no, thanks. Because it's $2 <laughs> and above. $2 and above. That is correct. So thank you to uh, everyone, uh, whether it's at $1 or $2 or anything above $2. We appreciate all of our Patreon supporters. We're going to have a giveaway of sorts for our Patreon only members tonight, and then we'll also be uh, we'll have a, some kind of a giveaway here for the DD Marksman League. Uh, Dynamic Disc has graciously offered to uh, provide a little bit of a giveaway every week while Marksman leagues are taking place. So how, go out and find one. How nice of them! Of course, that's so nice of them. All right, uh, we're here in the after show. A full disclaimer, as usual, it may or may not be disc golf related. Any topic is potentially on the table for discussion, and we're far more likely to uh, completely and fully interact with what we see taking place on the YouTube live chat. So if you've got a question, it's a great time to ask it. Uh, We may somewhat alter it and or directly or indirectly get to it or not. So that's how the after show works. I know some people are like, what in the hell are you guys talking about? Like we said, we make no commitments to it being exclusively about disc golf, although usually it is. Uh, Well, we'll start out disc golf related because Uh I, I saw two things very heavily related. One, Latitude 64 is looking for a social media person. I did see that. And so was Prodigy. So was Prodigy. So we have two companies that uh, Prodigy is looking for one in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Traditionally, and I don't know, they've worked with Marty McGee, McFly, mm-hmm. so high in the past. So I don't know if that relationship is done, if maybe they're looking for above and beyond that, maybe someone to do more social media. Or in tandem. Or in tandem, exactly. So we'll see what comes of that over the next few weeks and months. And then uh, it looks like Latitude, according to Bobby, is looking for someone in the Emporia area, probably to work with Bobby and uh, is it a- and, and um, Anthony. Anthony, I want to say Andrew for a second. Anthony, in conjunction with the uh, Dynamic Disc guys, so we have Latitude and Dynamic Disc kind of maybe hand in hand working there. So yeah. I, I, I'm I'm always happy to see more social media people being hired, especially for our disc golf companies so uh, uh, to further those both uh latitude 64 as bobby has posted and talked about you can go out and uh, find that post or we could maybe link to it but latitude 64 again looking to work in conjunction with bobby as you just Mm -hmm. said uh, the very first question that is always asked especially being a social media type and or media related job is yes you do have to relocate or you have to Maybe you don't have to relocate if you already live there, uh, but you do have to locate to Emporia. So I know that's the first question. I know Bobby knows that's the first question. That's why he put it right there as the very first answer before questions were even asked and said, yes, this person needs to be in Emporia. I'm guessing you will actually come to the uh, the Dynamic Disk Warehouse Distribution Center, and that's where your office would be. So just so you know, if you're looking to fulfill that role or position, that's exactly where uh, you would need to go. Uh, and then again, we, with Prodigy, we're unsure as to, uh, we don't want to, I, I just wanted to further clarify that we're not looking to start a rumor. We don't know. I think Marty is in fact, uh, has a contract with them again. So I believe uh, this would be a second dairy person to join Marty to do some things. And like you said, awesome. maybe maybe they're just looking to to get to that two camera coverage that we've seen and grown accustomed to and been spoiled by. And so that that's why he need they need that other that second uh, consistent person. I'm guessing it's something along those lines. They said they would prefer uh somebody with those editing and filming skills and ideally have a drone and be able to fly that as well. So that's what makes me think this would be a um, a secondary person to accompany Marty in coverage responsibilities and tasks. So uh, those are all out there. Tina Stenitis, I think. Uh, what are we, jobs.com here? Uh, Tina Stenitis <laughs> also made a post, I think just today, saying that she's looking for a seamstress of sorts to assist with her, uh, what I believe would be uh, exclusively making whale sacks. 
uh, unless she wants you to, I don't know, make up dresses for her, more dresses for her to wear. But I think she likes making those. So, uh, but Tina Sinaitis of Whale Sack. So if you are a seamstress or known or no one that might be interested, uh, reach out to her, t- tell her that uh, Smashbox TV sent you. And uh, I know I, I don't know any other details about it, but I, I saw a quick post about it as what is, was echoed on the board uh, here that she's looking for help. And I'm going to go ahead and say, I'll take it a step further and say that uh, the disc golf guy in terms of post-production for events, especially when I'm live uh, with Johnny and, and Smashbox and our crew, uh, the disc golf guy channel would also be very interested in some help. Compensation... Minimal. <laughs> is it negotiable or negligible? <laughs> it depends how you spell it, but either one probably works. Uh, uh, but seriously, if you're an editor or a filmer or you can film and edit or maybe you can, you're can, you really good at editing and you need just somebody else to capture it, whatever the case might be, I, I am definitely looking uh, for some more people to uh, join in the production of ramping up the Disc Golf Guy channel. Uh, in a post-production sense as well. So, Continuing on the jobs note, we see Miles, what? Miles Parkhill out there asking if anyone wants to work at Paragon. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what he's looking for. Uh, I, I do think I know. Uh, Miles, uh, if uh, Miles, again, Miles Par- uh, Parkhill over at Paragon, he, I think he is looking for a, uh, I'll say, a uh, primary ad- disc golf associate, somebody that can handle some more of the specific disc golf interactions. Oh, very cool. Uh, that means you'll probably be working with clubs, working with things like bag tags, uh, tournament specific for uh, ordering t-shirts and uh, other apparel, towels, hats, that kind of stuff. Those are all types of things that um, I think would fit within that job description over at Miles from Paragon. So if you are in the Springfield, Illinois, or want to relocate to Springfield, Illinois, that also might be an opportunity for you. All right. And let's uh, let's finalize our jobs discussion with not people looking for jobs, but people that got new jobs. What? What? The PDGA. I got a new job. No. No, no. I, I need a new job. Well, tell me about it. I need you to get a new job. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, yeah, Terry. So, all right. So the PDGA has, I wouldn't say brought on four, but we've seen four job moves and some new faces at the PDGA. Um, Sean Sinclair, Steve Hill, Dalton, was it Slantis, mm-hmm. and Mike Downs all have now positions with the PDGA. Mike Downs has been, I don't want to say upgraded, has been uh, promoted. promoted to a director of operations. So Mike's been with the PDGA for like five years as the events manager. And now he's going to be working with uh, look like it says here, what uh, local organizing staff and all sorts of fun stuff. So congratulations to Mike. He was one of those guys that n- not that I think he is, would have been necessarily the right guy for the position, but his name was kind of bantered around a little bit for the director position. There were some talks of that and, He's a very smart guy, and we enjoy him quite a bit. Uh, media coordinator, Steve Hill, who you guys know from Ulta World. Uh, I talked to Steve today for a little bit about a couple questions regarding the podcast uh, for Ulta World and the new one. He is brought on to work with Marty Gregoire. They're going to kind of split duties and work together. Steve's also going to, I think, head up a new, well, revive the PDGA radio podcast that has been dormant for so long. So I talked to him about that. He might be looking for a co-host. Uh, he has. He said he has some ideas. I I gave him one or two as well. Yeah. What are you doing there? Jeez. Trying Terry. to. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's uh, there's that. And he did say that the Ultra World group will probably be looking for another co-host as well. So he won't be able to. Sweet. So I'll put an application in. Awesome. I can't wait. <laughs> Uh, Dalton Slantis, the International Disc Golf Center assistant and marketing. So congratulations to you. He's an avid disc golfer, but he's also a veteran of the United States Army. Having served in both Germany and Afghanistan, his role is in the service, was geared towards information technology. He's an IT guy, a man of my own heart, and satellite communications. So congratulations, Dalton. And finally, event support, Sean Sinclair. Sean's been working with the PDG for like 100 years doing all sorts of things. He's usually the guy for uh, AM and Pro Worlds that will go out check out the courses. He's a little a, bit of site review. Yeah. Site review. He's got a really good eye for that kind of thing. So now he is officially a, a event support. Uh, and he's also very much been uh, t- 
along that role in terms of uh, previewing courses and uh, taking a look at things before it happens, uh, some of the on-site logistics and whatnot, but also uh, fulfilling a role as a marshal. Uh, he's been very active. He was with on the, the rules, rules committee, so on and yep, so. He forth. was on the disciplinary committee when yep. I was. I was a couple of years ago as well. So yeah, and uh, also I think what's interesting to note is that uh, with Sean Sinclair accepting this new role, he has actually then uh, has uh, resigned from his position on the PDGA board of directors. Oh, uh, which I believe he was on for four and a half years. And that I didn't uh, know. I, uh, so with that, I, there's a, I, I don't want to say stipulation. I think there's some kind of a uh, guideline or, oh, yeah, or, here, or official. It says here, uh, Sean's position will not be backfilled as the move brings the board back to seven members, which is the minimum size the PDJ board of directors in accordance with our bylaws. Oh, so Dave uh, Clement is asking, will Steve uh, Hill still continue to write for Alta World. I'm going to go with a big fat negative on that one. He's going to be actually writing for the PDGA now. Okay. As... I, I think his his position with Alta World will be splitting. It'll be a nice clean break. Um, and he will be uh, strictly PDGA from here on out. I, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I've, that, that that's what I've kind of gathered. Well, and I, I've also then spoke to our PDGA media manager in um, our boy Media Marty. Mr. Gregoire. Gregoire. And I had reached out to him and just said, this sounds, all, all after all these announcements were made, I said, this kind of sounds like a, a plan that I heard you uh, <laughs> discussing a few months ago, and how is this going to impact you? And he said, this will be great. I am uh, not going to be looking at 110 days of travel this year uh, with my wife and, and uh, children. Uh, that I have back at home, so not being gone nearly as much is going to be great, and that that may get trimmed to as much as uh, in half. So, uh, it him and Michael Downs have just exhausted themselves in the travel that they've been putting in around the country. Again, it's not just the national tours; it's the Am Worlds, the Pro Worlds, the Masters Worlds, the Junior Worlds. Now, there's so many activities, plus all the other majors, the women's the masters majors, the amateur majors, the doubles majors, all of those. So uh, they've been quite, they've been stretched and uh, and depleted a little bit by what's been asked of them. So to have them getting assistance, I think is going to also refresh them. And it's just going to make the overall, uh, the, the organization and the support network so much stronger. So uh, I, I've worked with all four of the people that have been hired in some capacity or another. And I just I have nothing but great things to say about all of them. So super excited to see it, and uh, I think it's just going to make the organization that much stronger. I agree. And uh, Dave Clint says, "So go big, and the PDJ will hire you." I think I don't know if he's talking about Alta World, Alta, Alta World, or even you could really wrap that up with Gregoire, who kind of put himself out there for a while, doing yeah. doing some social media stuff and made himself a a valued employee and then PDG end up hiring him on. If here's what I'll say about that. If you think that the PDGA is missing something and you go out and do it on your own and prove that there is a value in you, I would be willing to bet that the PDGA would maybe find a position for you if you can value yourself at or, it. Or contract with you potentially yep. or you know whether it's a as you're saying, a direct hire or a contract or a partnership. Uh, if you really look at the innovations that have come about. I mean, look at UDISC just recently. Exactly. You, you look at someone like UDISC and uh, they've they've went out and they fulfilled a need that was, uh, uh, that I don't even think all of us knew we needed, but they went out and really filled mm -hmm. a need out there. And now uh, PDGA, and, and same could be said of the registration services. For many years, that was kind of a, a looming challenge within the PDGA, and they wanted to develop in-house, and it just didn't really work out that way. And then ultimately, Peter Christ, who had invented and created Disc Golf Scene, uh, ultimately you know, uh, relinquished that and, and sold that those components over to the PDGA in this uh, process. So if you're really good at something... Go out there and uh, make things happen, and you never know. Your, all your dreams could come true. Or you could get underpaid it, and join us at Smashbox. I was going to say, if, if your dreams are probably be underpaid for your position, Disc Golf is the place to go. Yeah, it is. Not just the PDGA, but Smashbox and any of our video guys or any of our media. I, I'm willing to bet that you know the PDGA is a nonprofit. 
they, they can pay okay, but my guess is that you're not starting there. All right. But make yourself valuable. And Fish Bass Collect Glass says it perfectly in this day and age, uh, which is creating your own job is a key to success in today's world. Uh, if if you if you have that gumption and foresight and drive and passion, then I completely agree. I, I, I of course, entrepreneurial spirit. I love it, and uh, I, I've kind of lived it for these last fifteen or twenty years. But I've also realized it's not for everybody. Not everybody can uh, <laughs> likes to jump off a cliff with no parachute either. So. Uh, but that is one way to go about it is, uh, go find your passion and then somehow find a way to make money at your passion. Good way to do it. Finally in PDGA news, um, no surprise to anybody. The women's global event is returning in May this year. Uh, we, we kind of, I think everyone kind of knew that it says here, May 12th, 2018 is the PDGA continues to encourage more women across the, across, I'll see you there, across the world to get out and play disc golf. So you can look at the PDG if you go to pdg.com slash women's dash global dash events dash returns dash may, <laughs> or just go to pdg.com and look at the news and it'll give you a link to it. Uh, there's a whole nice graph about the, how the, the increase in size from 575 to 1060 to 1300, uh, the number of events that have increased. There's a nice little infographic there. So please go and check that out. If you know a female that wants to play, get signed up, get her set up. And let's make this one even bigger. I think we're going to do probably the women's symposium at some point, a little bit, maybe March ish. I think that's when it's unofficially slated for. Yeah, is, not not hundred percent uh, sure, March. but we'll get it figured out. A uh, couple of things on the board coming in off of the YouTube chat board, uh, official PDGA weekly podcast. We'll see if that is in fact what the, then becomes. Oh, is there a super chat? Who's oh, Wes, Wes Warren, Warren. Appreciate it. <laughs> he says, here we go. Now that I got it figured out, super job, super good job tonight, buds. Super good job would be $80, not eight Wes. No, I'm, I'm totally kidding. Uh, thank you very much. We appreciate it. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. $8 is kind of an, it's kind of an odd, it's an even number technically. Uh, <laughs> it's a funny number. Thank you, Wes. We appreciate it. That, that gets you a DX disc, which we love, which we'll probably turn around and give away. So Ryan Pilcher <laughs> for dealing with intoxicated fathers on the chat board. Uh, Ryan Pilcher super chats us for $5. Come on now. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, one of the other things, I think it was cool one who keeps saying on the board that we need female representation at the, I think he said the PDG front office. Uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and say, like in a lot of situations, I, I think, it, well, we just had this uh, a very exhaustive search for, exhaustive, exhausting search for our PDG executive director. I don't know exactly the number of women that applied for that. Clearly, I think with an entire panel of people uh, doing uh, the job search, and then the whittling down, and then the con the three or four or five separate uh, rounds of interviews they went through. I I'm not going to question that the best person uh, necessarily that yeah that the best person got the job. I think uh, I would totally agree. Joe Chargaloff is is great and has been oh, great, yeah. and uh, so I'm not going to second guess any of that process. I know there was. Uh, I only know of a few women. Actually, I think I only know of two personally, two women that uh, had applied for that job. And uh, so for whatever reasons, uh, like hundreds of others, uh, it sounds like they just uh, weren't quite as, what's the word I'm looking for? Quite as uh, qualified as uh, as Joe was. So uh, in front office, I mean, and, and I'll go ahead and say, uh, Rebecca Duffy was our PDGA board president. For I don't know how long multiple years uh same thing i guess i gotta say it's like anything else we we need more women which is like we need more women to play we need more women to apply and uh go out and get those positions i, I think if there's a qualified woman for any position within disc golf she has every uh chance or likelihood of earning it as the next person she just has to be qualified for it all right um what else is out on the board uh all female film crew. Uh, that, that's something that's been talked about and we won't harp on it too much, but a lot of uh, people have said, you know, we need more, more film crews or, and, or more, or should we have women out there filming the women's crews? So there's more women's coverage. I'd love to see it. I, 
I, I don't think it matters if you're a man or a woman filming uh, <laughs> any given division. But sure, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see more women's coverage. I'd love to see more men's coverage. I, I don't think there's any downside to that. Hurricane Disc Golf, uh, glad you're out there from Illinois. Good to see you, Kenneth. I hope all is well. Uh, Wes Warren uh, asks, if I get a sex change, could I play FPO in the PDGA? There is a, an official uh, link out on uh, on the PDGA that talks about, uh, is it the Stockholm? Yes. St- not policy, Stockholm something. Uh, but but it's all out there. It's addressed. It talks about what, what the, those procedures are. Um, qualifications or, or designations, it's all out there. I know that the PDGA follows a very similar uh, stance and policy to what we see, I think, in the Olympics. Yes. Which I, to me sounds like a pretty legitimate um, organization to follow suit of. So uh, that's what I can say about that. More moms in disc golf. We need more women of all ages uh, in disc golf. Uh, Let's just hope there aren't. I think any people more. just want more moms for you in disc golf. <laughs> um, let's hope there aren't any more Tuesday night disc golf pot. Good luck, Stockholm consensus. Thank you. That's uh, yeah, not the Stockholm syndrome. For. That's nope, different. Nope. Stockholm consensus. I, I'm glad I didn't. I, I was I waiting. I policy, so I'm glad I didn't yes. guess anything else dumber. Correct. Not far off. Um. Seth Fenley's out on the board from PD or uh, well from the Disc Golf Pro Tour. Uh, excited to see Seth throughout the year. He's going to be doing some social media action as uh, as he did so uh, and volunteered his time and efforts. Someone asked earlier, I think I now recall that uh, is Steve Dodge independently wealthy? The answer is no. No. Uh, is he getting wealthy right now? No. No. Uh, Steve Dodge, this was all in the entrepreneur conversation. No, Steve Dodge has a vision. He's got a business plan. He's got a five-year plan. He's got, uh, you know, plans of taking losses, plans of earning money, and everything in between. Uh, he's He's got an overall business agenda and plan for it. And uh, so, no, money's not being, nobody's making it rain. Money's not sprinkling from the sky. Uh, and Steve's not sitting on uh, mountains and mountains of dollars. I think is the fair way to put that. Is there a skip ace update? I think uh, you had a you had one last week. Anything well, the, else? Uh, so the, I was supposed to have one last week. The, the the gentleman who I'm working with actually ended up canceling that meeting. He's like, I'm doing a lot of good work. I just can't sit down with a meeting for you because I've got a couple other like, as I jokingly said, Sounds some like BS. some real clients that he deals with, not some Yahoo like me. Because uh, this guy does do this professionally, and yeah, well, I am paying him, but it's not nearly what his going rate is. So, our new meeting is scheduled for tomorrow. So, okay. yeah, so I should know more. He says he's got a lot of good stuff for me. I'm really excited to see it. Um, I, I, I even told him I said I got people chomping at the bit that want more updates, and it's not even me. I want updates, but I've got other people that are kind of getting on. It's like, all right, let's uh, let's get this going. We've only really got like about three weeks. Uh, three to four. Oh, I guess it is. It is coming up quicker than I realized. Yeah, it just yeah. I, like I, I really want to get this done, and I want to get this moving, and we need to we need to pound it out. Worst case scenario, if we have to skip, uh, if we if we have, if I have to leave out the t- the uh, um, Las Vegas Open event, I could do that, but I don't want to. So again, I should know more again tomorrow, as I have a calendar reminder, and I'm having a meeting tomorrow at noon. I'm really excited. All right. David D says sarcasm, as in Steve Dodge. Does he have sarcasm? Yes. Dollars, no. Uh, Steve, again, we've said it for years. I, I'll admit I was immediately drawn to Steve the first time I ever interacted with him. And I consider him a very, very good friend and uh, a great ambassador for golf. Sometimes, not everyone, sometimes people don't understand his humor. And sometimes people understand his humor and just don't care for it. And I think that's said of all of us. Of course. Uh, but Steve being in the position that he is, he, he has a very uh, uh, loud platform to, or big platform to stand on. And, and sometimes, uh, and he knows that and we continue to joke about it. Uh, sometimes he misses the mark when he's trying to be funny. Um, and I'm good with that because I'm the same way. And I always feel like I've said it for years. If Steve makes me laugh, I'm good. It's too bad that everybody else doesn't laugh all the time. There were a few times at the PDGA Summit just a few months ago 
Steve was presenting in front of 20 or 30 people in this room, you know, PDGA board members and otherwise. And he cracked a dozen jokes that nobody but me laughed at. <laughs> Just the, the room, a little cold room. A little bit. And uh, I, I was like, eh, I don't know. I was okay with it, but uh, that's the way it is. So uh, PDG, okay, so Luke has clarified. Thanks, Luke, for doing some research. PDG ha- have, hasn't adopted the IOC policy, which is far more up to date. IOC 2016, Consensus 2010. IOC has very specific hormone levels for competition readiness. So we'll we'll see how that unfolds. Stockholm consensus is actually 2003 dated, not 2010. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Makers Telemark says, great guy, horrible commentator. Again, <laughs> I'm biased. I, I enjoy Steve's commentary, but it sometimes apparently misses the mark, and he's aware of that. Ryan Pilcher talks and says that he missed me on Saturday night at the indoor challenge. Um, I went to, and those of you that follow us on Facebook, if you're not, please go ahead. Cause I do, we do try to kind of put little things up like that. Ricky Wysocki was in town for our indoor disc golf challenge. And I said that I wanted to make it a point to get out there. And I did on Friday night. It was a lot of fun. This is the first year I've been free to be able to get out and take a look and check it out. I really wish I had a, I was able to play Ricky. He, I walked around with Ricky for a little bit. We chatted, and um, at one point, he just handed me some discs. He's like, give it a shot. Go ahead and throw it, and it was ace race night, so I, I threw two holes, and neither of which did I draw metal on. Um, one had a giant inflatable hot air balloon in front of it. Mm. It was probably about 160 feet, <laughs> and the other was probably about the same distance, but you had to throw it through a hole that was probably 14 inches. A 14 inch circle, I would say, um, from about 180 feet in order to smash the chains. And I missed that as well, but it was a lot of fun. So props to those guys out there. If you want to take a look again, go to our Facebook page, take a look at the videos, try to set something like that. If you have an indoor soccer league or an indoor soccer facility, I'm sorry, talk to them because that's what they did and you can set it up. So it's not really, so it's not destructive. Most of those indoor soccer facilities are pretty well constructed that throwing discs isn't going to hurt anything like someplace where there might be drywall. <laughs> but uh, it was awesome because I, I went live and and there was a gentleman who came right on the, the broadcast and probably the hardest hole of the course. It's It plays 260 feet probably down a, a tight alleyway uh, with a, about a 15 foot drop in elevation. And he just drained it joe just, michael joe michael yes and just it, it was a it was a perfect shot and ricky was right there for it and everyone was celebrating it was uh it was a lot of fun i i enjoyed myself quite a bit oh there you go it was funny seeing ricky knowing uh, i communicated with him i think on thursday or friday and he was coming to wisconsin i was heading to uh arizona of course and then sunday about uh, with a few holes to play, all of a sudden I look and there's Ricky walking along with the lead card. I'm like, hey, oh wow, hey, Sunday yeah, already. So he got back uh, Sunday morning sometime. He was there until Saturday night, mm-hmm. but he got back Sunday morning, came right out to the course to watch the final few holes of the event, and we chit chatted back and forth a little bit. So uh, uh, good to see him. Right now, it doesn't look like he's on the schedule to play Maricopa, but it sounds like his arm could maybe be twisted. But there's a waiting list, and uh, so we'll see. We'll see what ends up happening, but. Uh, looking forward uh, to Maricopa this weekend for sure. So, all right. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to catch up with the chat. Anyone go to Katrina Allen's putting clinic in the bar? I think it was this past Thursday. I'm not sure where, where that took place. I'm guessing Minnesota uh, would be my guess. I think uh, I didn't see Katrina in Arizona. I believe she was someone had said uh, she's in, uh, excuse me, in Minnesota. Uh, Saturday night did not end until 2.30. Ricky was there until the end. Of course he was. That a boy, Rick. Oh, I feel bad. Disc Golf Nerd, I, I didn't delete your um, your review you sent me. I still have it here, the two for one. What? I just honestly didn't get a chance to play it. We were so, last week, we were busy with a couple guests, and I said, oh, I'll, we'll get to it next week, because thinking that this week was going to be slower, and then Terry came out this today, and he's like, um, we're going to have Steve and Jen Allen. I'm like, okay, cool. Oh yeah. And we're going to have Felberg early. I'm like, all right, yeah. cool. And then we're going to have Yuli. Yeah. 
And I was kind of like, at it. wow, that is, that's a lot of guests to, to be shoving in one show. So Darn it. I have your review, Disc Golf Nerd. Hopefully it's not time sensitive, but I will, I will make a point of it to make sure we get it. Uh, I meant to start the show with this, but I had 10 other things I started the show with. I would love, and it's not too late because you're our diehards anyway. We love you the most. Don't tell everyone else. If you are a regular Tuesday night live viewer, it would be greatly appreciated if someone out there would do us a favor and help with some time stamping. And what all we all you got to do, super simple job, is relay, make a little note sheet. You can even take a picture of it if you don't want to put it into a phone or into your computer or something. Write down some times of, I don't want to say important things because you'd be there all night. Uh, write down times of uh, major changes within the show. And by that, I mean, you know, tonight at 9.10, Dave Felberg came on. At 9.34, uh, Jen Allen and Steve Dodge came on. At 10.42, Paul Ulibarri came on. Uh, and if you just give us that time, that would be great uh, because what I want to do is then go back and then make the notes and you can make a quick little link on YouTube and then people that do want to follow along can click right to something or I can reference it later on in the week or if I ever want to say, hey, we caught up with Dave Felberger, we caught up with Jen Allen, uh, it, then I have those exact times. And if somebody's doing that, quote unquote, real time, it just makes it that much easier. I'm, I'm not going to say I'm lazy, but uh, Johnny V volunteered to do this two years ago. And oh, it, I, I did it every once in a while. but And so anyway, the point <laughs> is, yeah, I it's not happening anymore by either not. of us. So uh, that would be awesome. Why don't you just... Uh, Amp South says, why don't you just... People write the time in the chat board. Uh, the problem is our chat board disappears. That's that's something else that may be a little known fact. Whatever you guys are live chatting with at the moment, this will all disappear. Once YouTube actually takes the video, the live stream, and then processes it into a video that they archive and put up on there, everything from the live chat from tonight disappears. So if you said something really smart or brilliant or insightful, or thought provoking, it's gone. It will be gone. It's uh, in fact, you can only scroll up so far right now, probably. Uh, but things are gone, so uh, that's why. Um, well, that doesn't really fix the problem anyway. But anyway, that's where we're at. If somebody uh, wanted to keep a running log on any given night of of the major transitions within the show, it'd be greatly appreciated. Maybe you could email me. You could send me an image, post it, whatever, uh, and then I'll update the pages accordingly. Uh, Ryan says, wouldn't it be easier to give the time into the podcast instead of the time of night? It, it yeah, I guess one, it's one in the same sort of, yeah. I mean, we start, we always, for the most part, start at nine. You're, you know, if, if you give us a general idea of when that is, that's, that's great. And if, if you're listening to this or you're watching it on YouTube after the fact, if you can put it in the comments, that works as well. Uh, because we get notified of comments, we can kind of add it in there. It's just a matter of n us not having a lot of time to go back the next day and mark that and put them in the in the stuff. So I barely pay attention while the show's happening, let alone be able to take uh, notes <laughs> of what's going on. That's all. If somebody can do it, great. If nobody can, that's great. Yeah, too. we're not. We're, we're currently not doing it like we like we want to. So it's not like we're missing. Cool one much. says Terry. You promised us guest Lisa. Fakus, who we don't know very well. You're right. Interview. Thanks. Good call. We'll have to reach out to Lisa, and we should probably do it sooner than later. We'll reach out to her, maybe see if we can get her before we head into the uh, 2018 Pro Tour season. Seth says, the disc golf guy, moving forward, I will try and pay attention. That's all we ask. Steve Dodge once famously said, everything starts with, I'll try. He's an insightful fella. What are you? Uh, what are you guys going to be talking about? No idea, Jordan. Uh, when, where, how? No idea. You guys going to be covering the Winter Olympics live this year? Well, they they reached out to us. <laughs> and I, was, I was just was a little a, too busy. Yeah, I, I I couldn't quite swing it. I'm and, trying to get to the gym three days a week, and I just couldn't quite fit in the Olympics coverage. Uh, Unfortunately, no. 
All right. I'm, I'm going to check some notes. Uh, I think I've covered pretty much uh, most of the other things that were talked about. Um, yeah, I think I've, yeah, wow. Pretty impressive. We've covered the only other interesting thing that's kind of, but not really related to disc golf, uh, uh, DGI, DJI. Now I keep screwing it up. You're going to screw it up forever. Uh, DJI came out with a new drone today. They announced it, uh, which will be kind of cool. In that you don't, you don't think that's going to impact how more people buying more drones potentially could assist more. I, I watched a card of golf. I the other day, I've never heard of the channel. I don't know the gentlemen that were doing it. Drone previews every hole. You don't think that's going to become more common? No, I'm saying whoopity do is that they release a new one every six months. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, no, and I'm, I'm glad. I, I love it. The, the cheaper and the better the, the cameras get, the better the drone quality is, the better the battery, the longer they'll, the longer they'll stay in the air. And it's, you know, it's more likely to do it. I'm not whoopity doing the fact that they released in. Well, I am whoopity doing the fact that they released a new one because they they are releasing them every six months at this point on new well, one. Well, they keep improving, and, them, and I think that's, that's cool. And that's great. I, I'm I'm more power, but it's kind of like so. It's kind of like me saying, "Hey, Samsung released a new phone. <laughs> uh, Apple released a new yeah, phone." Yeah, those it's don't like, impact us as much. I think drone bo- 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 baloney, baloney, baloney. I, no, no, no. I don't think in terms of disc golf, you think Samsung releasing a new phone is going to affect the disc golf community the way cheaper better drones is going to do it uh, we have what three three organizations that really use drones or, or do video right now i i know well you don't think that opens an opportunity for more no i don't think i don't think a cheaper drone opens an opportunity for more people to do video i think it i think it's better for people who are already going to do video to do it i don't think someone's gonna be like Boom! Nailed it. The seven hundred dollar drone. Now I can get into the video business. I think baloney. More people with, I think, better, I, cheaper. If you're better, in, less expensive drones, are just another tie-in or incentive for people to up their video I don't production. Disagree. I don't disagree. Okay. Well, that's exactly what I was saying. I don't think it's going to have anyone get into the business. It'll help them up their the people that are in it. Or again, if if you have if you have an inkling to get into disc golf, it's because you probably have cameras. Drones are a secondary thought. You're, no one's getting in because they can get a cheaper drone. If you, if now, if you told me Canon came out with an awesome 4K camera for four ninety nine or five ninety nine, I'd be like, there it is, a drone. That that's that's your frosting on the cake. That that's what I'm saying. I it, think it oppor- it, it, it opens the opportunity for someone who maybe doesn't even give a crap about cameras or about filming to maybe specialize in getting Poss- drone coverage. Possibly. Sure. There that's again my point. I, I don't I don't think it's gonna happen, but sure, it's a possibility. All right. Yes, yeah, Samsung does make a phone, Birdie Boys Disc Golf says. Uh, I know what I meant is Samsung make a new phone every year. No, like, I, I know. What no you meant. nobody's getting excited. Just like an iPhone. No, you know, unless there's something revolutionary like, oh my God, suddenly it can do six hundred frames per second, you're like, awesome, and it looks good. But uh, I think tired of crap out on the board says, which is so funny to, I guess, keep repeating, um, had made a comment that he, he knows James, I am friends with James Conrad. We hang out all week at two days in May every year. He lives in Virginia. I can get him if you guys want. Uh, again, w- we had brief conversations about having James and talking to James earlier in the year. Mm-hmm. Maybe now is the time to get him, but as we said, he was out camping. He was out enjoying life. He he's not as much of a. It's I don't think it's he's trying to avoid us or avoid the opportunity. Uh, it just didn't present itself that was convenient for him. Um, so I think at at some point it would make sense to have him. Dave Clement with the great pun of saying you're droning. On. Uh, and no, none of this yet in terms of this new drone does impact anything in uh, in the world of live coverage. Uh, that we can very much put to bed and shoot down as an idea that uh, it's a newer, smaller drone, uh, still with a 30-ish minute battery life. No live coverage related to that anytime soon. Uh, local route has good coverage, okay. Um, and Country Disc Golf, Matt says, there's a couple of guys in the Mobile area filming disc golf on iPhones and gimbals, mm-hmm. and they have a GoPro drone that they use. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think improving phone 
camera quality is going to bring more people in because people, everyone has a phone. And at this point, other than a little bit of zoom, your phone camera, if, if I'm standing 10 feet from a player and Jomez is standing next to me, 10 feet from a player, you're going to be hard pressed to tell me the difference between those two cameras. Now, when you're talking slow-mo stuff, that's a whole different beast that the Jomez cameras, they do mm. the things. Now, it gets a little bit more, I'll say this, their cameras help out a lot more when they're doing flight follow and slow-mo and you need to look at it through uh, in the sky. But just standing there at a tee box, I think my iPhone with 1080p 60 frames per second you would have a hard time telling the difference between mine and theirs. Correct. Unless you need to zoom. Of course. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Tony says if it was a Samsung drone, drone I'm in. Unless it bursts into flames. Uh, you got to be it. careful. Uh, Alan Risley says you guys need drone coverage for Smashbox on Tuesday night. <laughs> just hovering in my office. <laughs> just like, just, yeah, right there uh, uh, with like just the slightest uh, change of angle. Yeah, that would definitely be pretty awesome. It would be. Uh, <laughs> uh, live drone coverage in studio. <laughs> get James on. Get James on. Everyone says get James on. James and Lisa Fakus. We'll work on that. Uh, that FS7 Jomez uses records at 180 frames per second. Uh, tomorrow you're going to see an. Uh, un, un, it's not really much of an unboxing. I'm going to open a box. I got some goodies from uh, my friends over at Legacy. And I think I, while I'm at it, I may debut uh, some other discs that I have from uh, my friends at Latitude as I'm going to be gearing up to uh, have a couple special fundraiser releases for uh, for equipment uh, upgrades. So I think I might do an unboxing of both of those tomorrow. So that'll be on, I don't know disc golf guy somewhere so look for those um some cool stuff hopefully one let's, of the boxes i haven't even opened let's give away the marksman disc let's do it how are you gonna do it i don't know how you're gonna do it i, I say we just give it to everybody on the board just send first person to say me i'm just kidding just, just send just bobby kidding. a list of everybody <laughs> yeah, there you go, we screwed up the giveaway <laughs> you owe 109 discs tonight <laughs> i wonder what he'd say to that uh he would tell us no <laughs> oh bobby Come on. I don't know why you got to be so picky. Ray Woodruff said me first. Uh, Country Disc Golf says, the first time I filmed a tourney, I had to use my phone to record the upshots and putting to battery limitations with the camera used. That's, uh, that's yeah, wow, that's rough. Uh, have we done the giveaway yet? No, Marcus, we're going to do two giveaways. We're going to have a Patreon giveaway and a DD uh, Marksman League-related giveaway. What do we? What do they give away again? Is it a couple, a disc or two? Yeah, a disc. Is it a disc? Yep, we do a disc. Uh, a marksman, a disc every week that we cover the marksman league. So we wanted to make sure All you right. guys get first person to answer on the live chat. Here it is, folks. The first person to answer on our YouTube live chat per the chat that Johnny and I see. Okay. Per the chat that Johnny V and I see, it may look slightly different on your screen, but the official one is the one that we see because there's no better way for us to do this. So per that chat, for the Marksman Disc League Giveaway Disc, thanks to Dynamic, the first person to answer this question correctly, not quite, the first person to answer it correctly is, earlier I mentioned... Uh, this, so you had to be paying attention. What is the official cutoff date for you to register your league by? Go. What is the official cutoff date? I know I mentioned it where you have to register your marksman league by. It's not 1983, <laughs> although that's a good guess. That's a that's someone's... Ray Woodruff. I think has the answer. Looks like. February 16th, Starfire, as always, comes in as an answer. I love it. The 16th must be right because a handful of people put it out there. Yes. The 16th, I mentioned it earlier that you must register your league by the 16th. And Ray Woodruff 
February 16th. Thank and you. I'm, and I'm going to go out and say congratulations, Ray. We're not going to do duplicate prizes for marksmen. So if you win right. a marksman, you're, you're not ineligible. El- you're ineligible from here on out. Patreon, not the same. We, you, you know, if you can win Patreon over and over and over, as we've seen some people do. Uh, but so congratulations, Ray. We will uh, get us your information. We might have it already, probably, and we'll pass that along to DD so they can get that stuff. And while we're at it, you know, we can probably do our Patreon giveaway. I think that uh, I, what I have here should probably work out. I just downloaded all of our wonderful Patreon supporters. And right now, we, like I said, we took a big bump and I'm so excited. Um, we're at 165. We've been at like 157, 158. Uh, a couple of people adjusted theirs. A couple of people, you know, changed whatever. So it is... I'm v- I'm very pumped. I'm actually going to hide this those columns so people can't see emails. No one needs to see that. Let's spam some people. That's right. So what you're seeing here right now will be the the sheet of all of our users. And David D s- says peace out. You're not going to stick around. You're not a Patreon supporter. You yeah. don't want to know if you're part of this giveaway. And so all right, so we have 165 <laughs> We're going to go to random.org. Well, I'm, I wasn't paying attention you know, a moment ago. What are you doing? We're going to do the Patreon giveaway. Oh, okay. Yeah. Patreon giveaway. What do we got? Oh, yeah. oh we'll show them. It's a surprise. We'll show you after you win. Depends who it is. <laughs> <laughs> is it here? Uh, number 58. I don't know. Do you have something? <laughs> no. Not here. I have something at home. I'll give All right. You. So number 58. Number 58. Brantley Morgan. That's a new name. Congratulations, Brantley Morgan. I love it. I uh, appreciate your patronage. Bam. Brantley has been a Patreon supporter since April, April 28th. Thank you. Thanks. What is it? What is he winning? Something I find in my office tomorrow. So it'll oh, be good. Like a pen? No, no, no. My office is loaded with disc golf stuff. Of That's course. true. There's probably no real office supplies in there. There's <laughs> no. just. You're... Except for the printer I got to work last week, which I think I posted about the, the wireless printer. You did. You're not getting my printer, though, now that I finally got it to work wirelessly. It doesn't seem like it should be that hard, and like for whatever reason, no, it was harder than it should have been. Okay, uh, our good friend Kazi put it best and said, uh, "It seems somewhat ridiculous that you need to plug in all the cords to get it set up to then make it wireless, and you would just think it would somehow be smart enough that you wouldn't have to plug in a printer cable to a USB." to then eventually get it to be wireless. I'm guessing you didn't really have to. I I think I might have. <laughs> I I've, finally got it to work that I, way. I've set up, and then if that's the way you got it to work, it's fine. I've set up a couple dozen wireless printers for employees at their home. Never once have I had to plug it into anyone's computer. Usually you bring it in. Uh, first time, maybe it, not. But I think there was something to be said about the fact that I had it working and wired it, almost as if it, I don't want to say programmed it. That's not the right word. Uh, it was a pain. I'm just going to tell you. I'm, hey. glad, I'm glad you didn't call me and I'm glad you got it working. <laughs> exactly. I was so proud. All right. Uh, so, yes. Uh, Ray uh, Woodruff, reach out. Smashbox.tv slash winners so that we can make sure to have your information there. It's also an older. It was an older I, laser printer. I don't care. So it's, it's not as sophisticated as the ones they hand out today. <laughs> Samsung came out with a new printer. <laughs> I thought maybe DJI would have. You know, it's a flying printer. It just hovers in your office. <laughs> something like that. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll find something good and we'll give it. I think I'm all caught up with Patreon giveaways. If I'm not, please reach you, out. I sent out. Did you send out more discs too? A ton too? of stuff. Uh, no. You didn't send out the Patreon discs no, yet. No, maybe I'll get on top of that. But I, I have sent out otherwise uh, any good. Patreon winners as of recently. I think I finally got all caught up. I'm excited to get the office officially cleaned up so that I can be more prompt with getting those things uh, shipped out more regularly. Sometimes they build up for a month before I get them all shipped out. Infinite disk drone dr- delivery. That would be sweet. We gave away a $100 gift card. Uh, the Next Gen Tour did give away a $100 gift card along with an umbrella and a pair of waterproof socks uh, a little earlier. Well, okay, four hours ago, which is pretty awesome. All right, guys. I don't know. Do you have anything else? 
No, not I've really. I've got some follow-up with uh, Jennifer Allen, who's uh, following up with me after the long conversation that was had uh, earlier tonight. Well, uh, I think you're going to see a little bit of a follow-up post from her tomorrow. Uh, with a great conversation that we had, and hopefully uh, everyone understands everybody a little bit better. You can yeah. always ag- agree to disagree or not, but at least everybody understands everyone else's position a little bit better. So I think that uh, was definitely uh, accomplished. That goal was accomplished here tonight. Yeah. Again, it's all about communication. If As long as there's clear communication, it's hard to complain. It's, I mean, you can still do it, but you can do it. I'll do it. I'll find a way. All right, we're going to call it a night. We appreciate you guys, each and every one of you, even if Johnny doesn't show your credits. Yeah, I know. Jerk. I'm very disappointed that. that you want to try it again? No. At the I, end of this one? It's still sitting there locked up. Oh. I'll do the other credits, though. Okay. Super chat credits? Super chat credits. Are those feed in? Those at, f- is there a reset button? So there was like three earlier and then two? It'll reset once uh, only after we restart the live. So you're going to get those three plus the other extra so ones that we saw in the after five, show. Five, all five of our super chatters tonight. Well, we appreciate that. Yeah. And it's, it's again, I like to. I like to play with things, and this Streamlabs thing is something that uh, that a lot of other streamers use on Twitch and things like that. So it's very adjustable. There's all sorts of fun stuff we can do, and I think it's it's always fun to uh, to recognize the people that give back to the show. We love you all, some more than others, apparently. Yes, <laughs> we do. All right, guys, uh, it's been great. Thank you guys for joining us. Many of you were there for the original. Uh, or for the regular show and stuck around all night. You're crazy, but we appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all of our audio listeners. I guess we never thank you guys, but we we do uh, appreciate you guys tuning in. If you've somehow made it to the end of the show, uh, God bless you. You're you're very special, and we appreciate that, whether it's audio or video version here on Tuesday night. Well, of course, be looking forward to talking to you next Tuesday night. We'll see if we have a different winner uh, from Arizona on the men's side. Uh and we may catch up with whoever that is. Could be Paul Ulibarri. It's not going to be Seppo because he's not signed up, so I don't think he's going to win it. But uh, we'll likely have that winner featured next week along with some other great content. So for Johnny V and myself, this is Podcast 179's After Show. We look forward to seeing you next week when you step inside the Smashbox.